This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, hello and welcome to your live safari experience that happens every day, twice a day, except for this morning where we had a morning off. And we thank you for your patience in that. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Archie is on camera with me and we are live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya. We will also be joined by our South African crew once they manage to A, change a tire and B, get out on foot a little bit later. Oh, it is a blisteringly hot afternoon and they say that uh, filming live wildlife is something of a gamble. And I have to tell you that these elephants have not rolled the dice in my favour. Well, I don't know if you could say that they did. That's a bit of a weird mixed metaphor. But they decided to walk away to the other side of the road and have now moved really far away. So you'll just have to join me as we trundle along. But for our new viewers who have just discovered this live stream, it gives me an opportunity to tell you that not only is this live, but you can ask questions just to prove it's live. So if you don't believe me, you can ask a question on the YouTube comments or on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter if you feel so inclined. I better remove that bright bottle of suntan lotion and move that away. Whoops. My mistake. Sorry. So that is how you can get hold of us. Obviously, you don't just have to ask us questions if you don't believe we're live. You can also ask us questions about what we are seeing. And in fact, that is your greatest chance of having your questions sent through and said out live. Now, said it's a blisteringly hot day. Initially, it was um, the weather station seemed to suggest it was 22 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 72-ish. Um, it's not. It's about 28, which for the Mara is warm. 28 equates to 82 Fahrenheit. It is still far hotter now in South Africa, but it's plenty warm. Oh, windy for the Maasai Mara. The weather has gone back to its usual style of storming in the afternoons. Carol, you want to know if there's any news on waffles today? Now, I was going to do an entire drive dedicated to the migration, which has well and truly arrived over there. And I'll still do most of that. But Carol wants to know about waffles. I want to know about waffles because I haven't gone to see the wafflets since yesterday morning's end of the gauntlet series. So I'm deeply concerned about the little wafflets. Carol six? Carol six? Am I getting that right? Carol six? Sticks? I don't know if I've suddenly lost my ability to hear names. Driver's fast asleep. <laughs> His guests are all taking photos of the Ellie's. And he is fast asleep in this front seat. Oh sweet, look at these Ellie's over here. Let me block up the entire road quickly. Always ends well, especially in high season. Having a little push backwards and forwards and the little one would like to join in as well, please. Thank you very much. I will go and see the little wafflets today. And if for new viewers, that means little spotted hyenas. Waffles is the name of a hyena. Oh, this is wonderful. So the bull and what actually looks like a cow met. Clearly not though, that must be a bull. No, it was two bulls. And a youngster who just got involved in the whole process. The light is so blindingly bright right now at this time of the afternoon, it's almost hard to tell. It does really, I mean, the shape of that forehead looks like a cow. No, it is, it's a cow. She's just had, um, she's just urinated and maybe she has a bit of an infection as well. There's a cow. Interesting, so she was saying hello to the big bull that tried to intimidate us earlier. Didn't work, but I let him save face. Now, I'm going to go and find you a couple of wildebeest, and by a couple I mean a couple of wildebeest. However, Sydney has beaten me to it.
I have got a head of wildebeest here and where I am I can see that the wind is blowing too much which is very much difficult for me to hear what is happening. A very very good afternoon and welcome to the beginning of our guided walk. I am Sydney and I'm not traveling alone this afternoon. I am with my camera operator Dave and we are going to try by all means to give you the best experience ever. For questions and comments you can you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live. You can also follow us on YouTube chat stream. Look at this wildebeest, very nicely relaxed. The weather condition is about 33 degrees. It's quite very hot at the moment here where I am and it's punctuated with quite a lot of wind. This wildebeest now might be enjoying some rumination as wildebeest are part of those animals which are ruminants. Ruminants, I'm talking about the animals which normally goes out for feeding purposes and when the sun is very hot like this is when they are going to have a chance lie under trees and bring back food to the mouth and chew some card which is a very interesting adaptation because it does help them in order to prevent loss of water from the body because they don't have to feed all day long they just got together a lot of food early in the mornings when it's hot it's time to eat the very same food again Uh, thank you very very much for a hot welcome back yes indeed i enjoyed my leave it was too short but i really enjoyed the leave and when i'm back now i found that the weather is completely different now it's getting very hot i've got to prepare now and have some of the clothes which will help me during this kind of weather conditions so let's just move a little bit further and see if we can have a better visual of this wildebeest. So while I'm moving, while I'm moving much closer, let's see James is also out on a game drive at the moment. Maybe James does have something interesting at the moment. One does hope that I will have something interesting. I must stop shouting at you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be in the world, different time of the day, of course. My name is James Hendry, and we are approaching a spot where Hosanna the male leopard, there is Tingana the male leopard, right in front of us. Hello, Tingana. There he is. He stole a meal from his son, Hosanna, yesterday. And we're just going to see if we can't get a view of both of them. Well, that's very nice. Okay, that's a good start. Now, we have something of an embarrassment of riches today because there were wild dogs as well on the reserve. There were lions on Chitwa, which is another reserve we're allowed to go to. So I thought we'd start with the lion, with the leopards, and then sort of decide from there where we might like to go. Can you see the other leopard anywhere? I did see this one having a bit of a growl, making me think that... Uh, Perhaps the sun was around. I'm just going to maneuver through here as I tell you, of course, that we'd love to hear from you on the Sunday afternoon. You can use the hashtag Safari Live. You can use the chat stream on YouTube. And I think there's the only two ways you can talk to us. I used to make the hilarious joke that sending us a written letter by post would be a waste of time because the South African Postal Service is so terribly poor and that has not changed. Please also do not send a fax. We do not deal with faxes. So we ease up here. We are quite close to him, so I just need to be quite sensitive to how close we get and how much noise we make around him. And of course, make sure that we don't nearly run over Hosanna somewhere. Crunch, 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 crunch. Tell me when you've got a look at his face, Fergus. You should have now. Yes? Now, once we've had a look at Tingana, I'm pretty sure that Horsana is around here somewhere. The reason I chose to come here first was because it's, uh, well, it's going to be in the shade, really. I'm just going to ease forward and then we'll, there we go. There's his face. 
it's in the shade and it was fairly guaranteed because up in the tree to the left of us we can see the carcass. Bonnie, identifying different leopards can be difficult unless you know the area quite well. We know this area very well. We know that the leopards here are territorial, of course, they're territorial everywhere. And so if we find a male leopard in this area, well, then we're pretty sure uh, as to who it is. You can quickly gauge the age, but also it's just like you can recognize your own pet. We see them so often that when we saw this leopard immediately it was obvious it was Tingana. He's got a big fat head, he's got a, a dewlap, which is the loose bit of skin that hangs beneath his throat, and it was just obviously him. And what he did was he stole that Nyala kill from his son yesterday. I'm pretty sure his son will be here somewhere. And I said, I'm just listening to some rustling in the bushes. I said that he looked like he might be growling when we got up here. And I wondered if Hosanna, his son, wasn't trying to get towards the tree to have a small Sunday afternoon snack. I don't see him anywhere at this stage, but it's very hot out here, and so it's not very surprising. Alrighty, we'll have a look around for Hosanna while we do that. Let's go back to Sydney and his Wildenbeestens. I am still enjoying a very lovely sighting of the world beast here. The whole head is just standing there looking at us, feeling them. So when looking at them, I can easily distinguish between the male and females. If you can look at this one, one in front of the screen now is a female. The females, they've got a brown forehead. And the one on the right, if you look at the forehead nicely, you will see that it does have a black forehead. So that is how we can easily distinguish between the male and the female wildebeest. The one which is moving the head now is the male, and the one standing on the left is a female. So you can see the stripes clearly. That is why this animal is called a brindle gnu. Brindle is just a term meaning the stripes. It's like a striped gnu. It's so very interesting to see that the wildebeest here are at their own. Normally, these kind of animals, you see them walking together with other animals. Mostly, their best friend is the zebras. But today, they don't have zebras. And one of the reasons why they join other animals is their poor eyesight. So I don't know how they are figuring it out today at, at, as they are working as a family without any other species involved. But to me, it seems like they do have a a good sight because they are giving some of the warning calls looking at the direction where I come from. So now we can see if uh, in Mara uh, the blue wildebeest are doing same as the wildebeest in So we see your wildebeest, Juma, and we raise you hmm, a couple of hundred thousand or so. I think it's safe to say that the migration, late as it is, has well and truly arrived in the Mara Triangle. Now it's not fair to compare, of course, because this is what the Maasai Mara, one of the things that the Maasai Mara is famous for at this time of year. The mass movement of around about one and a half million wildebeest moving from Tanzania into the Maasai Mara itself. You will notice if you are new to these viewings that there is a subtle difference between the wildebeest that Sydney has been creeping up to and the wildebeest that we see here. And that is because these are a subspecies and they have white beards. An impressive little difference. They are still blue wildebeest but they have little white beards, which I think is a very attractive thing on a wildebeest, personally. This was just to give you a taster. This is just a little hint as to what I'm going to take you to. What you will notice is that they are seriously clustered around the burn. 
And that's because now all oh, that now it doesn't look so good. Hmm. Well, it looks a little bit thin to me, a bit limpy. Well, it has just had to cross the Mara River. Gemma, you want to know what the difference is between a gnu and a wildebeest? They are the same thing. So a gnu is literally the name given to a wildebeest and it's based off a the sound they make. So what we'll do is we'll try and get away from this ever-present Mara wind. I'm not in any way irritated by it at all. We're going to get away from the ever-present Mara wind. I'm going to pop you right in the middle of the herd. And then you can see where the name comes from. No. No, 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 Pretty much continuously, non-stop. So that's what I'm aiming to do. These guys are a little bit far, although I can see them. They really, it's amazing how fast it all arrives, how it all happens. I just want to get you into the main body of the herd. Then we'll find a lion, then we'll go see some hyenas. I think that sounds like a plan. Stop blowing! Ah. I should be used to it by now. My goodness gracious. So, while we are searching for large numbers of wildebeest, James's leopard sighting has increased by one. Yes, we've got the other one now. Here is Hosanna, the male leopard, who's even more active than his father. As you can see, he's inherited his father's superb ability to sleep. There he is. He did make the kill, after all. His belly is not looking as full as it was yesterday, and so I don't think he's had anything to eat for about 24 hours now, I'd say. Poor fellow. Tristan was just saying yesterday how it was so amazing to watch how Tingana waited for 20 minutes sniffing into the wind, picking something up, not sure, and once he'd picked up on where he thought this thing was, he walked straight here from about two kilometers away, just over a mile. And after that, well, there really was nothing poor old Hosanna could do about it. Now, you're asking how we could tell the difference between the two. I mean, if you just saw this leopard lying here and you saw the other one lying where you saw him, uh, you would really struggle to know the difference unless you knew them. And the easiest way to do it in this case would be to look at the face and just above the whisker line there, and you'd see a different spot pattern there. You can see he's got three spots just above the whisker line there. He's got three on the other side as well, and his father has five and five. So that's a good way of telling. Oh my goodness, this is very impressive. We're going to go to the nest cam now with Tristan. Indeed we are, James, and we are with animals that I'm sure Hosanna is dreaming about as he sleeps away the heat of the day. So you can see a little herd of impalas that have come in and decided to have a little bit of a drink and quench their thirst. It is a, a warm afternoon, quite windy, but still very, very warm. And so it's the perfect time of the day for impalas to come down and drink. And I would imagine that they would have had a bit of a torrid morning because from what I gather, there were wild dogs all over around this area. And so making lots and lots of noise. And so most of the impalas, I'm sure, probably heard that and were thoroughly petrified by what was going on around them. No impala, I think, likes wild dogs. But if you look at the impala in the middle of the frame, there's a massive impala that is there. Look at the size of his horns. He really is quite an impressive individual. So he's on the left-hand side now. And I believe that today is World Dog Day. Is that right, Kirsty? World Dog Day. So that would be quite apt to have wild dogs running around on World Dog Day. Hopefully we'll get lucky and we'll be able to see them maybe coming down to the pan for a drink. If they're around, then it's a good place for them to come. They will maybe come down and drink. And that'll be quite nice. Now you see there's also a little baby Nyala in amongst all the Impalas that's just drifting off. There you go, trotting away. It's too much commotion for a Nyala. They like a quieter 
day and quieter drinking point than with all the hustle and bustle of male impalas that are scattered around everywhere. But what a beautiful view it is when you see all these animals coming down to drink and like I say, hopefully it will be a busy afternoon at the nest. Now while I sit here and wait for other things to come down, let's send you back across to Hosanna and see if James agrees that he might be daydreaming about these guys. Well, yes, that or Nyala. Unfortunately, he lost a Nyala to his daddy. So maybe he's thinking about Impalas and Nyalas. I think he's thinking about a great deal right now. We're not going to spend very long here because these kitties are flat. We are going to go off and see if we can't find the wild dogs. I'm told that today is World Dog Day. I don't know if that means world dog in general, the entire family, world domestic dog, world wolf and wild dog. I'm not sure. Anyway, I think it would be appropriate for us to go and see if we can find the wild dogs from earlier this morning. That is simply because these cats are flat and we can come back here as it cools down because I'm sure there will be a little bit of conflict over the kill. Apparently it's not World Dog Day, it's National Dog Day in the United States. Well, still, it's a good excuse to go and see some wild dogs. You can see what Tingan, at least what Hosanna thinks of National Dog Day in the United States. Not very much. He's not a fan of dogs, nor is his father. Don't like dogs at all. Schmidt, yes, I think they probably would survive. Indeed, they are extremely adaptable leopards, and you know, they'll eat anything from, like I say, quite often termites all the way up to young wildebeest. And I think that as long as they weren't killed by the hyenas and lions of the Mara, they'd survive very well. An example is the introduction of tigers to the Karoo. The Karoo is a semi-desert region in the central parts of South Africa and there have been various attempts to breed tigers in those areas uh, without feeding them and tigers are pretty good at killing local antelope here or uh, gazelles. They kill springbok quite successfully and hard to best and various other things and they adapt to hunting in savanna ecosystems uh, very easily and I imagine that with the leopard being the most adaptable of the big cats, it would struggle not one jot moving into the Mara if you introduced one there. And of course people do introduce leopards from time to time. If, let's say, a leopard is found somewhere in a, an urban setting where it might be perceived to be a danger to human beings, well then they would, might well take the leopard, uh, dart it, and introduce it to a wildlife area were, you know, a long way from where it was born and quite easily could survive. So yes, I think that they would survive. I don't think it's a good idea to take Tingana and Horsana to the Mara. Uh, I think that uh, that would be risking them, rather. I think they're quite comfortable here. You can see that Horsana doesn't look like he needs any more of a holiday. My goodness, he's looked up. Hang on a second. This is unbelievable. Oh, and he's having a stretch. Sticks his claws out. Now, oh, maybe, let's just wait here. Let's see if he doesn't think about trying to get into the tree for a snack. His father is sitting right below it. There'll be a bit of hissing and spitting. Should he try and go towards the tree and get into it? Yes, you would like a bit of Sunday roast, wouldn't you? Mmm. I'm not sure I'd like it as much as I'd like another few minutes. Oh, no. I wonder if Tingan is not going up there. He's doing a little bit of a chuff towards his father. The chuffing noise is the exhalation of air, quite fast, friendly and submissive exhalation of air. That's what it sounds like, sort of. Tingan is just around the corner there, through this little sort of gully. Let's just let this play out for a second. I'm not sure what he's going to do. And Michelle, you say go, Hosanna, go. Yes, I kind of feel the same. I feel like he needs a good meal. He certainly ate on it for a long time yesterday. I mean, he had a good, he had a good 12 hours at it on his, 24 hours at it on his own, actually. He was harassed by some hyenas, but I think they've given up. 
Are you hungry, fellow? Weighing up the heat versus the effort. Oh, here we go. I'm going to move now. Just because I want to be in position if he gets near the tree. Naturally, there are bushes placed strategically by the elephants to make it as difficult as possible. Now, this is where we were yesterday for the TV show. Yeah, there's the cat. He's moving in towards the kill. The kill is just over the gully to the, at least the other leopard is just over the gully to the left here. And there's the tree with the kill in it. And I just want to get into a position so that if Tingana does decide to launch himself at his son, we will see it. All right. I think that'll do us from there. How's that, Ferg? Is that okay? I see that um, there's been some... Here we go. Very unkind. I wonder how long this has been going on. There's Hosanna now waiting. Sorry about the aerial. Difficult to place ourselves in a position where both cats are in perfect picture. I was just saying, there's been quite a lot of gardening around here since we left yesterday. Yvette, no, I can't smell the kill. There's no question that Tingana could smell it yesterday, though. It hasn't had... It's had long enough to start rotting. But I can't smell it. The wind's blowing from there, so I'm not sure why. I've normally got a very sensitive nose. Can you smell it, Fergus? Mm -hmm. No. So, Hosanna obviously not giving up on this, but I think he'll be lucky to get a look in here. I'm just going to shift forward slightly. Sorry, Ferg. Let me just shift forward and then we can have a look at Tingana, probably. So, when you'll get him in a gap through here. Yeah, back a bit. Is that fine? Now, I guess many people must be thinking that's very nasty, that's not very kind. Well, kindness ain't a big thing out here in the wilderness. And this old boy hasn't got to 12 years old as a dominant male leopard of a prime piece of the Sabi Sands without knowing the rules of the wild and applying them to himself to the greatest possible advantage. And that's what he did there. You killed it, I don't care. You are my son, I don't care. This food is for me, that's what I care about. I can get it and so I will eat it. You can go and find something else to eat. It is a harsh attitude to take to your son, one that we as human beings probably find a little repugnant. But it's how it works out here and therefore how it works best for leopards. You can see how much more grizzled his face is, how many more conflicts he's experienced, how many more thorn bushes his ears have gone through. Yes, and all of you feeling very sympathetic towards Hosanna, I understand that, but he's okay. Like I say, he did feed on it for at least 24 hours. Quite interesting also, I mean, I think Tristan was saying yesterday that he thought Horsana is probably 20 kilograms lighter than his son here. I'm not sure it's as much as that, but he is smaller, definitely, than Tingana, that's Horsana. And I think that the amount of experience that the older cat has really does make a big difference to his ability to dominate these interactions. 
He knows how to posture. He feels confident because this is his domain. This is his territory. All righty, let's see, wait and see what happens out here. We'll go across to the Marcy Mara now, where Jamie Patterson seems to be in the thick of the thundering hooves of the migration herds. What a phenomenal way to start off our sunset safari with those two leopards coming to together, I guess would be the best description. Oh, we have arrived at one of the main bodies of the herd, and I promised I would let you listen, so here you go. Have a listen to exactly what it is that the wildebeest is saying, and tell me what you think. This goes on constantly. So what on earth are they saying to each other? Here? Here? Marco Polo? Is it some giant, enormous game of Marco Polo between wildebeest? It's essentially largely the males that make these calls, and it's... <laughs> Kirsty agrees. Kirsty thinks that it is Marco Polo, one giant wildebeest game of Marco Polo. Instead of in the pool, it's in the long grass of the Mara Plains, with a very dangerous added extra in that while you might be participating in a game of Marco Polo, you might also be attracting a lion. I find, I'm afraid to say, wildebeest intrinsically comic. Except when they're throwing themselves off the banks of the Mara River and breaking their limbs and getting dashed on the rocks and drowning and eaten by crocodiles. Apart from those somewhat tragic times, I find wildebeest hilarious. I can't help but feel any other way, especially... <laughs> Kathy, actually, you've probably got a closer, a closer call there. Kathy's saying they're all saying, move, move. Move, 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 like pedestrians bottlenecking around some roadworks on the pavement of a busy, busy city. Oh, and now we've all stopped. Why? Why? We've all walked in a long line. In fact, we're all still walking in a long line to come and join this group. Why? Where are you going? What? I know that it's the rains. And I know that it's how this whole process works, and I know I've been here before. So please, someone explain to me how they decide where they're going to go. I know they follow the grass and all of that, and it rains, and then they go there and they eat some more grass. But how they decide from one part of their day to the next, actually, you know what, we're going to go from that ridge to that ridge, or that ridge to that ridge with no real discernible reason. I don't know, it's, just, it's fascinating to watch them. To say make decisions would be a stretch. Oh, oh, somebody's thirsty. Luckily there's been lots of rain. We'll all just check for crocodiles. And crocodiles, no, I think you're going to be okay there, wildebeest. That is a really small puddle. Still not certain, though. It's a, I promise you it's a very small puddle. There's no big crocodile in there. You will be okay. I suppose I can hardly judge it for being slightly traumatized. Yes, it's crossing everyone. Look at this. It's gone into the water. Is it going to go across to the other side? Will it survive the gauntlet? I'm oh, sorry, I mean the puddle. Oh, I think it's okay. I think it lived. They're quite pretty when you look at them. I wanted to find you a male, because the big males, when they start running around chasing other males, is also hilarious. And then they get distracted by a female that apparently smells more attractive than the rest, and then they desperately try and leap onto her back, her unsuspecting back, and she just kind of walks away from them. Quite hilarious. Yeah, lots going on there. They might be the world's greatest gifted mathematicians, we'd never know. But this is just the start. We're going to go to the Salt Lake, the great watering hole of the Masai Mara. Meanwhile, 
Sydney is at the great watering hole of Juma. I'm just trying to check if I can find a very nice place to dig a little bit so that I can show you something very much interesting. So I'm just looking for the roots of this grass. The name of this grass is called the coach grass. So the coach grass, their root system is very much interesting. And this is one of the very medicinal plants. I know a lot of people, they only think about the big trees as a source of medicine. Now I have got something different. If you look at this grass, you can see that it has got like a rhizome. So this rhizome is where this grass is storing the food for survival. So if you can take these rhizomes with these roots and boil them, drink that water is going to help you in order to clean the urinary system. This kind of a grass, while I was still very young, we used to go out to the field for plowing purposes. And sometimes when the mouse is dry, we used to dig and take these kind of sticks and chew them. They are very much sweet and chew them. And by so doing this, and then it does moisturize the inner parts of the mouth. So it is a very interesting grass and it's a very medicinal grass. It's not sour at all, it's very much nice. And a lot of animals, like the rhinos, white rhinos specifically, they prefer to eat a lot of coach grass. That is why if you've got coach grass in the reserve, where it is occurring, you will see the area will be having shorter grass because animals, a lot of them, they like to feed on this kind of grasses. So here I have seen that this grass is very much excited, it's growing very high because it's close to the water holes and this kind of roots can be able to easily absorb water to here from that close water hole. So now I am going to carry on and see if we can find something very much interesting. On this guided walk, I am expecting to see a lot of uh, tiny little animals. While I'm going to look for these animals, let's see, James is lucky with Tingana at the moment. Yes, Tingana, you can see, is not moved, but he's not reclining like his son is, and that is because he is deeply afraid that his Sunday roast is under threat. My father's quite the same, actually, you know. I, I'm imagining one last piece of roast chicken, me arriving uninvited at the house, uh, going to the fridge and trying to take the last drumstick. I imagine my father might behave in much the same way that Tingana is behaving towards Horsana. I don't think that he would stay awake for nearly as long there. I think he'd fall asleep quite quickly. Then I would have the chicken leg. Afternoon, Rex. Uh, two leopards still static, same place. I haven't gone anywhere else. I'm just giving Rex on an update on the radio there. Both are on the ground. I'm just telling you what they're doing now, obviously. He said, what are they doing? Are they up or down? A safari girl, yes, they certainly would challenge a leopard. If a wild dog came along here, both these leopards would be up into a tree very quickly. Wild dogs are not nice to leopards. Leopards, being solitary, well, supposedly solitary, are unwilling to take the risks to fight off a predator like wild dogs. And so you would find that they would seek the safety of the branches where wild dogs couldn't get at them. And wild dogs are a lot braver because they're in packs and they'd go for these leopards if they came along here. They wouldn't just come past, see them leopards and then leave them be. All right, how about we go and see about those dogs? Should we go and do that? I think we should. I think we'll come back here a little bit later, but I feel that it would be remiss of us not to go and see if we can find the wild dogs, and then perhaps the lions even a little bit later, uh, but I'm not sure about those. Well, Simon did just lift his head, but uh, 
That's why Tingana's eyes are open. We can't see him though. Um, Aiden, they don't share because it's just not what animals do out here. Some do, wild dogs share, and we'll go and see if we can find them now. But cats just don't share with each other. You know, not even the lions will share with each other. They fight with each other over food. And it's because, Aiden, they are, they are solitary creatures, which means they prefer to be on their own when they're adults. And that means that they will defend their food. It means that they will take every opportunity they can to eat because they don't know when they will next eat. And so they will always try and protect their food from other leopards or hyenas or anything else that might try and steal their food. There is young Hosanna, you can see him fast asleep. But every time he lifts his head, Tingana's eyes flick open. And there he is. This is very special for those of you who are perhaps new viewers. I mean, we're sitting here with two male leopards on a Sunday afternoon. This is not something that happens every Sunday afternoon, or indeed any other afternoon. But we have a unique situation here at Juma, because Hosanna the male leopard has not quite yet gone independent. Well, he's certainly independent, but he hasn't quite old enough yet to take a territory of his own, and so he's still living within his father's ambit. He's like a a maturing adolescent or young human being male who's living in the garden cottage but still coming into the house every so often to ferret around in the bread bin. And I suppose Tingana's perspective, if we were to anthropomorphize it further, would be this is my house and you've done nothing to earn yourself a place in a house like this, you know, you don't defend territory, you don't fight off rival males, you just mooch around here eating the prey within my territory. So this is your form of rent, old buddy, old pal. I'll tolerate you here, but make no mistake that if uh, there's food going, I'm going to have it first. And he certainly wouldn't be lying here calm and collected if Hosanna wasn't related to him. I think he'd be much more reticent about being tolerant of him and try and chase him off. And likewise, Hosanna wouldn't, I don't think, try and spend time around a male leopard that he didn't know well. It's still windy here, a little bit like it is in the Masi Mara. I doubt it's blown quite that hard, but the northwest wind of August still continues to blow, and we're now really getting into the meaty part of the fire season. It will culminate or climax with the first storms that come through this area, lightning strikes that set the tinderbox of this grassland or the woodland area to flame. And you fan that with one of these hot northwest winds and you can have something quite spectacular. And a little bit dangerous, of course. Spectacular as it may be, it's also a little bit dangerous. Right, young Tingana fast asleep there. So let's go back to the Walchas now in the Masi Mara. We're going to go up and see if we can't find the wild dogs while you take to the skies above the Mara with some scavengers. Lots of vultures. And it's really quite lovely because up until the arrival of my, the migration, I was barely seeing, if I was seeing one vulture a week, it was a lot. And I found that I actually really missed them. Is that a vulture or is that a, it is a vulture. It just looks a funny color in the sun. So we've got rupels and white-backed vultures, and I, for one, am very, very happy to see them. Um, the vulture numbers have taken an enormous knock um, throughout this ecosystem as a result of uh, poisoned carcasses, which is uh, deeply tragic. Essentially, a carcass gets laced with poison and laid out, sometimes aiming for the vultures, mostly aiming for other predators and scavengers, and getting the vultures as a side effect. But they've come back with, with a vengeance with the arrival of the migration. And most of them will follow the herd as it goes through its yearly rotation. 
Now they're here now because the wildebeest are here now and there will be carcasses strewn everywhere throughout the Mara Triangle. Well, Kathy, I don't know if I could de exactly de define the migration's purpose. Essentially, it is to ensure that there is enough food for large numbers of animals. And it just so happens that in this ecosystem, in this, in this particular way that nature has set things up, food is better here in the Maasai Mara at this time of year. And then for four months, the wildebeest and the zebra as well, because it does include a couple of hundred thousand zebra, they will then move back to Tanzania where the food is good. They'll give, the, in the case of the wildebeest, they will give birth there. It's essentially a massive circle, but to call it a circle would be to, to really oversimplify it. The herds split up, they move in different directions, but essentially they are doing a rotation around, usually led by the zebra. They're usually the first to arrive. They can utilize the longer stalks of the grass. You guys are having a good scratch there. What is the purpose of a migration? Essentially it just means that animals have found a way or nature has found a way to make sure that animals utilize resources in a sustainable way. If a million wildebeest were to gather and graze for 12 months of the year in the same place, there would be a disaster because there would be no more grass left. Now as the rains roll through, we are actually just coming out of the driest period in the Maasai Mara. Um, Jared's buddy, there is of course always a section of the population and I think it's around about 50,000 or so. It might be a little bit more than that. It could even be 100,000. I'm not sure of the exact number and I'll tell you why I'm not sure in a second. There, there's a section of the, of the wildebeest that don't migrate. There are some that actually stay local completely, but that's one or two individuals every couple of thousand hectares that stick around. Then there is the loiter herd, which goes up into the loiter herd, into the loiter hills in Kenya. That's L-O-I-T-A to avoid confusion. And they, that migration route is starting to find serious interference because of fences. So there's fences going up along their natural migration route. There's no fences between us and the Serengeti, but there, there is between where the loiters want to be. And so as a result, the migration is not quite getting the same numbers that it should be. That is, of course, how South Africa managed to do away with a migration almost as large as this one, uh, well, larger actually than this one, a massive migration of antelope that used to occur in South Africa that no longer does. I was just saying to Archie, it's, my, it's with great sadness that I know that there is no road to get us underneath that sausage tree. I really would love to go there. I know the lions love it there. I can see all the vultures sitting up there. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's lions underneath it. There are so many carcasses everywhere that the vultures are just everywhere. You can't use them at this time of year to find... Well, you can. You can, you can use them when they're landing, but you can't on the ground. You can't really use them when they're sitting in a tree to find cats. And just by the way, I don't think that tree's dead. I think the first half of it, or the right-hand side of it, is just losing its leaves in preparation of new ones. Okay. Now, no matter how many animals make their way all the way from Tanzania to the Mara, it will still pale in comparison to the number of termites in just one colony. A lot of people don't realize that when walking up here on the ground, we are walking right on top of the roof of quite a lot of animals staying under the ground. And some of these animals are the mongoose. Here, I have got a very convincing evidence that the mongoose are staying under the ground in this termite mound. So these animals that are staying under the ground, they are called fossoria. And these animals, by staying under the ground, they help themselves when it comes to animals such as predators because they can easily hide away. And the story doesn't end there. Apart from avoiding the predation activities, they also help themselves when it comes to the high temperatures such as hot temperatures and when it's cold as well. 
So you can see that staying under the ground is very much beneficial to these animals. So the animals that are staying on the ground, they experience quite a lot of predation activities. So here, a colony of the, so a colony of, of these mongoose is staying in here. Probably this is the dwarf mongoose. So the termite mound is becoming a host because in there the temperature is excellent and that is what is attracting these small animals. And I'm sure they are very much safe. Maybe the problem is if the snakes go in there, but the mongoose don't have that big problems with the snakes because they can kill them. So they are very much gregarious. They are not solitary. And for them to win a fight against the snakes, the chances are always very there. So they are very much shy. They might be hiding under this. Diana, the termites, they are not harmful to the other animals. Termites can be harmful to the animals that predate them. And the most predator of the termites is the artifact. The artifact can be able to come here and dig fast as 15 minutes a 6 meters hole down. And he can consume up to 400,000 to 500,000, half a million termites at the same time. Yes, they do have some of the predators which are more or less the same as their body size. The ants also predate the termites. And when ants are coming in, it's when they defend themselves. They fight against the ants. But when it comes to the artifacts, it's a big animal which makes it very difficult for this kind of small insects to protect themselves against. So I can now let's go to Jenny. She does have a small lizard. Interesting to see a lizard. I haven't seen any at the moment. We're sorry to drag you away from all the action, but we've got you something really pretty to look at. And I was so worried that it was going to dash away, although I have to say it's been very, very relaxed. A rock agama, a beautiful, beautiful member of the lizard family, who is currently making use of the late afternoon sun before the evening chill sets in. I once heard David Gitu, Gigi, our wonderful Kenyan guide, call them Spider-Man lizards because of course they've got the Spider-Man coloring. Now there was a second one there. Where's she gone? She's gone into hiding. She's obviously more shy. Oh no, there we go. Now, I'm saying she, that's not an absolute. So Agamas, it's the usually the big males that have that bright coloring and the females that have the dull coloring. However, sometimes you get males that actually almost imitate the females and they, as a result, get away with hanging out in a more dominant lizard's territory and sneaking in quickly when he's not looking and grabbing hold of the female. So it could be a male or a female, but I'm guessing most likely it's a female. What's fascinating me at the moment is that opening behind their eyes it's enormous and protected by very clear scales. Now I assume, and I should know this, I assume it had something to do with hearing. Anyway, it doesn't matter right now. Let's go and see what James has found for you. Well, it's difficult not to have found them. They were standing right in the road for us. Ooh, one of them is getting a little bit irritated. We've kind of blocked the road, which I didn't mean to do. But now they've kind of wandered around us and they're close by, so I don't want to start the engine. The big matriarch, I think that's the big matriarch to our left, she's kind of given us the beady eye, decided she can get around us without tipping us over and turfing us onto the ground. So we're just going to sit here very quietly. They're very close, only about two meters away. And they're so close I can smell them. They've got such a lovely comforting smell to me. The best thing I can liken it to, or the most obvious thing I can liken it to, I suppose, is horses. They smell a little bit like horses do. And I always found that a comforting smell as a kid. 
There's a little one coming towards us now, going to show us how very strong he is. You are so strong. Oh, yes, what a strong fellow. With her long nose, but a bit nervous. Nice to be next to mum. They are massive, everybody. It's difficult to conceive of how big they are until you are sitting this close to them. It really is quite phenomenal how vast they are. She stands at around 10 feet at the shoulder. It's pretty big. I'm just going to watch her. Her friend has blocked the way now. Well, she could go around the back, I suppose. She's now moving a fairly substantial knob thorn with her foot. That is unbelievable how strong they are. They're not particularly strong as far as animals go with regard to their power to weight ratio. So they couldn't do many pull-ups, for example. But they are obviously, by virtue of their sides and in absolute terms, enormously strong. There's one there with that very long tusk, and I think we know her. I think she should probably be called a toothpick or spear, one of the two. She's got one long tusk and one broken off tusk. Amanda, the one on the left, pregnant. Um, I can't see any that are pregnant at the moment, or non none that are obviously pregnant that are about to pop. It's only really then that you can tell if an elephant's pregnant. She might be, actually. This one here, Ferg, the one in front of us. She has got a swelling out to the side of her belly. Can we go to her first? This one here? Yeah. She has got a little bit of a swelling there. But I, yeah, I'm not convinced about that. Oh, some discipline being meted out by toothpick to a youngster. Obviously got a little bit testy in the heat. Now this herd has just been at Buffleshook Dam having a bit of a mud bath, I suspect. I'm not sure how much drinking they did there, given the foulness of the water. They certainly would have had a nice mud bath. There's tooth... Toothpick is now breaking a leaf in front of us. I see... It's difficult for you to see her properly. Yes, Paula, I think Toothpick's quite a nice name as well. Now, here comes a bull down the road in front of us. He's not particularly old. He is, however, in the process of testing that female for her readiness to mate. That is what he's doing there. I put him at about 30 years old. Look at him approaching the female. And look how much bigger he is than her. I mean, he's a monstrous size. I always think the females are enormous until I see a big bull like this. Can you see his hip sticking out there? I think he's had a bit of a rough winter. Doesn't look to be in the best condition. With his hip sticking out like that. I don't think he's in must. He's certainly not dripping at all from between his legs. There's none of that evil smelling green penis syndrome is what they call it, where they leak huge amounts of water. And he's also got a very rounded forehead. It's quite nice. We often talk about the bulls as having rounded foreheads compared with the cows. And there's a nice example of that. Now I wouldn't be too worried if this fellow turned to us and shook his head. I don't think he's old enough to give us too much trouble. There's a little bit of debate about elephants' eyesight. I don't think it's as bad as a lot of people say it is. I don't think it's fantastic. I've, you know, I'm just trying to think, when you're on foot, it's obviously difficult to tell whether they've seen or smelled you, unless you are downwind of them. And then they do pick you up. If, if you stand out in the open, they'll pick you up. But if you stand quietly in thick bush, they often don't see you. They also apparently have a blind spot pretty much where we're sitting in relation to this bull here. And 
if you were to approach from where we are now on foot and didn't make a noise, he apparently, and I mean I have yet to try this myself, would not see you. Obviously he uses more than just his his eyes to sense things and sense potential danger. This is quite cute. A little baby with a bull. Oh, this is very sweet. See, I tried to just touch the male. I doubt it's related to him. I would imagine that he'd be too young to be that elephant's father, but it's possible. And now another big strong one. Same big strong one that showed us how strong it was a little earlier. Yes. Feeling very confident in front of the big bull, who he knows will probably protect him should any trouble occur. So he, I would say he probably weighs in at around four and a half to five tons. And Paula, that little chap there, would only weigh about, ooh, probably between 150 and 200 kilograms or so, which is about 440 pounds. When they're born, they weigh 220 pounds. I mean, that is dreadfully cute, isn't it? Now the big bull giving him a bit of a smack, just saying, go away. I don't wish to be around you. He just gave a little bit of a, it wasn't a snort, it was definitely from the voice box, that sort of low rumble that they made, make. He went brrr, and the little one cleared off. Totally unconcerned by us at this stage. Not vaguely interested or worried about us, which is fantastic. It's ideally best when a four and a half to five ton animal isn't worried about your presence. I find that generally to be the most acceptable situation. I know, Ashley, I know what you mean. You can't stop smiling at this sighting. I feel quite similar, actually. It's just almost... Well, it's not almost, it is. It's a tremendous privilege to spend this kind of time with elephants, with any animal, really, in this close proximity, with any wild animal that has taken you into its confidence, almost, and said, it's all right, I don't mind if you're around. Don't create too much of a ruckus, but you can watch us feeding. I don't think that's necessarily a conscious decision this big bull's taken, but he's certainly not affected enough by us to let us worry him, which is fantastic. And it does very much feel like being taken into the confidence of a wild animal. I'm not going to move from here. I'm going to see and wait until these elephants move away. But Jamie Patterson is still sitting with her Mwanza. I'm very excited to hear what she has to say about her Mwanza. Awesome. I absolutely love those close-up Ellie sightings. I also really enjoy the opportunity for a close-up lizard sighting, so we haven't moved, because the Agamas haven't moved. So it's a chance for us just to sit and appreciate them in all of their scaly glory. Very, very rough scaled lizards. Sharp claws for gripping onto rocks and leaping after their insect prey. And this will be, believe it or not, this will also be a time of plenty for them because the number of wildebeest, alive or dead, will bring forth a great number of flies. I love how he was sitting there for a second as if to say, oh really? Tell me more. <laughs> Changed his head position now. But for them it will be a time of plenty as well. Lots and lots of flies, which means lots and lots of food. I'm still staring at that opening. I assume it's a sort of, a, you know, it's, a, it's an opening for an ear. 
and we're a, a simplified ear with a sort of tympanic membrane system. I don't actually know, and I want to know if it's got some degree of control over it. Now, I've never had a pet lizard with this or of this sort of kind. I've never had a pet lizard full stop. Now, I wonder if any of you out there have agamas or, or have knowledge of exactly how that works. Can they control it? Can they open and close it? I'm not 100% sure, and I'm curious as to whether or not they can. I assume they can. It looks like it. Why is so wide open when it's sitting in the sun? Listening, maybe? I don't... I'm actually not 100% sure. But I find it fascinating. It looks like such a vulnerable, unprotected spot. Poofy poof! Lizards are ectotherms. In other words, they rely on the outside temperature in order to control or regulate their body temperature. There are some lizards that have more control over their internal body temperatures, or at least are more functional at colder temperatures than others. A, oh, bye-bye. Now you decide you're gone. Okay, fair enough. Um, that have more control. A gecko would be a good example of one such lizard that can actually operate at lower temperatures. But it, So if they're cold, they go into the sun, or they go into a warm spot. If they get too hot, they'll go into a shady spot. But their energy levels will largely depend on their temperature. So if they're really cold, they're really, really lethargic. And they actually can't move all that fast. That's why, um, and not to name anything specific, that's why certain documentaries where they go running out and leap out and, and catch a snake that, you know, seems relatively docile and they, they show off their snake handling skills, a lot of those times those snakes have actually been put in cooler boxes first cooled down to the point that they do not have the energy to fight back or to move around or to move away. Which is a horrifying thought. I'm not saying any particular type of documentary, but that is occasionally the case. Horrible thought. That's why people who keep pet reptiles, of course, will have little lamps that help to keep them warm and help them to regulate their temperature. Crocodiles have quite a strong degree of control over their internal body temperature without having to rely too much on the outside world. But they'll still go and bask, just as these lizards are doing. It's been fun sitting with these agamas, but now it's time to send you back on over to Sydney, who, back from leave, is full of stories to tell you and things to show you. I have got one of the very, very much interesting plant here. This is a bulb. It's very much difficult to identify it, but this bulb, from how it looks, I know what it does. This is one of those bulbs people can use as an anti-venom and as an anti-snakes. Anti-snakes, I'm referring to, um, I'm referring to an act whereby when you come across the snakes, the snakes just got to coil themselves. They cannot raise their head against you at all. So what we do is that we come and we take this kind of skin, all these skins, and we also take some other piece. It's like a big onion under the ground. And we take that part and we've got to inject it in your body. And it's going to stay there and it will be there permanently, meaning that every time the snake picks your scent, it is going to know that this is the wrong person. I cannot fight against this person. I can't face him. And then just got to coil itself, and then you can be able to just take it from the house and release it so that it can go away. So we don't really kill snakes where I come from. We catch them and then release them for them to go. When having problems, if you've got a wound as well, you come and take these scales, you can use them, you can stitch them against the wound, then it can serve as an antibiotic. So this tree is very much interesting to see that now is now blooming. So this tells us that the trees are now starting to get excited towards the spring. I am sure this tree is having a mechanism in order to uh, regulate 
the predation activities because here where i am this is the only plant which is having the leaves which means this is going to attract some of the animals to come here so i'm sure this plant is having a, a high level of tannin in order to avoid animals from coming to feed on it other big trees are still waiting not yet convinced with the weather condition towards the spring interesting to see that the vegetation doesn't wait for any kind of an announcement to say now is spring let's bloom they know themselves that is the right time through a natural process very much interesting Ryan, thank you very much for the comment. Indeed, it is a very powerful plant. It's one of those plants as well people are using in order to fight against the evil spirit. Where I come from, if you buy a stand, if is it, a new, it is a new stand, even if it's an old stand, you're going to have to then call a traditional healer to come and do something at that stand and what they normally do the traditional healers they go and dig this kind of plant and they come and plant them in your yard when that plant is there it is going to help you against the evil spirit So now I hear James has got some elephants. Let's see how the elephants are doing this afternoon. I miss the elephant. We haven't left the elephants. The big bull has not moved at all. Toothpick is standing next to him or in front of him. And then a youngster is uh, sort of smelling the older boy to see if he's friendly or not. He's studiously ignoring the young bull who wants to be his friend. <laughs> the young bull just chased away a hornbill. <laughs> Some sort of deferred aggression, perhaps. Irritated that the old boy didn't want to be his friend. There is the hornbill. Sorry, old fella, it really sucks being that small, doesn't it? I know how you feel. You can probably hear the breaking of the branches all around us. No, Tony, that is a, it's a legend, I think, associated with rhino rather than elephants, isn't it? That they will stomp out fires. I've never seen them stomp out fires. I've been around elephants and fires. No, I think it's completely a legend. Now, look how this bull is trying to get at the bark of this tree. He's eaten the small twigs. Now he's flirting, but he's also, he's also trying to get at the bark of the tree, and you can see the little places where it's been stripped off. So he'll eat the, all of the little twigs and then try and strip the bark off. And, you know, that tree must be sitting there in abject terror. Fergus, there's an elephant about to tickle your back. Hello, my dear. She's the mother of the very brave one that was attacking us earlier. There he is. I don't want to start the car, obviously, so you're just going to have to deal with the aerial in the frame of the car, I'm afraid. Starting it will break the spell of this magic sighting. Now she's trying to suckle and it's probably going to start whining quite soon unless she's allowed to suckle so i was saying about this tree i think it's probably sitting here in abject terror because it's being picked off piece by piece but eventually one of them is just going to push it over i suspect Yeah, I think it probably was Project Alpha. That rhino thing about uh, was probably from The Gods Must Be Crazy, which is a, a fun film made in the 80s. I think it was the 80s, early 80s, about the sand bushman. Um, and, yeah, rhinos stamping out fires, baboons and monkeys getting drunk on marula fruits and that sort of thing, all no absolute nonsense. And in fact, those baboons and monkeys, as far as I remember, when I heard uh, sort of a, about the behind the scenes of that particular film, uh, 
think those baboons and monkeys were drugged. And that's why they looked as though they were drunk. I suspect that they probably infused the... <laughs> infused the fruits with vodka or something like that, yeah, which is horrible. It's really not nice. Is it beautiful people or funny people? That's right, Fergus is just saying there's another similar kind of a film where they did that. It may have not been The Gods Must Be Crazy then at all. Amanda, I don't know. As far as I'm aware, all mammals just about, excuse me, can get rabies. I know with the exception of hyenas and mongoose, which can carry but don't express rabies, so they can all carry it, but they, so if you get bitten by a, um, a mongoose or a hyena that has rabies, uh, you will get it, but it's not necessarily true that, well, in fact, the animals that have bitten you will not. I think some monkey species also can carry it and not express it. But as far as I'm aware, most mammals can get rabies. I don't know how an elephant would get rabies. It would be terrifying to see. But I'm going to say, on the balance of what I know about rabies, yes, they probably can. Have they ever? I don't know. Imagine having a herd of rabid elephants around the place. Obviously the disease would kill them very quickly, but it would be fairly terrifying until it did. Yes, I'm not sure it would be a good movie, Kirsten. Kirsten says it would be a good movie. It would certainly be a movie uh, that would sell, along with exactly what I was going to say, a little bit like Sharknado and Snakes on a Plane. Now, if you haven't ever seen Sharknado, do yourself a favour and don't, unless you have had too much to drink and have perhaps taken some form of a narcotic because then you'll find it very uh, amazing. It, uh, the principle of the film is that uh, basically what happens is uh, tornadoes rush over the sea and in so doing pick up sharks who are kept alive somehow within the sharknado and then dumped into cities. Yes, I know. It isn't that ridiculous. It sounds like something you dream about and I have actually not seen it, I've seen bits of it. They made four or five of them. We have a sort of low-budget movie channel in this country that uh, Sharknado appears on disturbingly frequently. <laughs> it's not good, Fergus, it's dreadful. It is... <laughs> yes. Jagged, yes, elephants on a plane. Not quite as terrifying as snakes on a plane. Uh, if you haven't seen snakes on a plane, again, uh, possibly best to do so at the back end of a big night or some narcotics, because some of the scenes in that are, A, uh, ridiculous, but to the point of being hilarious. Um, it's a, it is a, a, not quite X-rated, but it's certainly a, a highly age-restricted film. I wouldn't recommend watching it. But if you do, well, I suppose you might find it quite funny. Don't take it seriously, though, please. Snakes on a plane. What a, what a principle. Ah, I haven't seen that one, D-Hugs. Lake Placid. Or have I? I don't know about huge crocodiles. I haven't seen that one. I haven't seen Lake Placid either. <laughs> But Sharknado takes the cake. You can see this elephant is not vaguely concerned with Sharknado. In fact, I suspect he's probably never seen it. Now, Jamie, you must understand, Jamie's asking, what about Anaconda? Jamie has obviously not seen Sharknado, because if she had, she would know that it was in a different class. It is in a class all of its own. In fact, anaconda and snakes on a plane, I suppose, you might put in the same class, but Sharknado is in a new class of its own. Its level of ridiculousness is so bizarre. And Jamie says, I am correct, she has not seen Sharknado. <laughs> there 
A shark film filmed in Port Alfred. Yeah. Ah. Fergus is just saying there's been a shark film filmed in Port Alfred, which is quite near where my parents live. That's where Ralph lives. Yeah, along the lines of Wandering Bard, unless you can show me some sort of hard evidence, I'm going to disbelieve what you've just said now. You said you heard that Sharknado was based on some kind of real story. Uh, I am afraid I'm unable to believe that sharks have ever been sucked out of the water in numbers and dumped on the land by ocean-going tornadoes. You're going to have to show me some kind of documentary peer-reviewed evidence before I'll believe anything like that. As far as I'm aware, a tornado can't exist over water, can it? Sharknado. Certainly it generated enough interest for them to make four movies. Oh, James Richard, thank you for pointing this out to me. You say that there have been six Sharknado movies, not just four. Thank you, James Richard. Now even this elephant is outraged. You can see he stuck his ears out in absolute disgust. Look at him. He says, if you're going to stand here and talk such utter garbage while I am magnificently displaying myself in front of you, well, then I tell you what, I'm going to threaten you slightly. See, he's standing on his heel there. He's thinking about coming towards us. Now he's just going to walk around the back of this tree. Ryan, I think it's an excellent idea. I think Rabid Elephants on a Plane would be a fantastic film. And there goes our bull. That is the end of our elephant sighting as we consider Rabid Elephants on a Plane, a movie directed by... Um, I don't think we'll find a director to direct that film. Ryan, you might have to offer to direct it yourself, eh? James May? No. I don't know James Bay. Right, Fergus and I will try and find a director for this wonderful film, Rabid Elephants on the Plane, while you go across to Jamie, uh, who will give you something intelligent to say, I reckon. <laughs> I can tell James exactly who needs to direct that movie. I can give him a director, his director of photography, and his scriptwriter, and that is our very own Viam, or the wildebeest, as he has known. A one of our cameramen, our extraordinary cameramen, with a true sense for the bizarre. We spend extended periods of time out in the Mara, um, and often several days in a row with the same cameraman and you have to find things to keep yourself occupied because after a while I spy with mine and lie grass loses its appeal so Viam, Viam's distraction is to come up with different combinations of animals like a lilac breasted hyena and of course now that I'm thinking about it I can't remember one of them the leopard faced vulture not lappet, leopard-faced vulture, and, and so on. So if James needs a director for his movie, or at the very least a scriptwriter, I think he need look no further. I will, of course... <laughs> I will, of course, naturally, have to go immediately and watch Sharknado. And given that it comes as a recommendation from someone whose opinion I hold in extraordinarily high regard, and I say that without any sarcasm at all, because it's true. Even that sounded sarcastic. I'm really not being sarcastic. As, as it comes from someone whose opinion I hold in such high regard, I will, of course, expect it to be everything that I have been led to believe. And I will in no way um, accept that it is, it is not a good movie. Next thing you know, we're going to get sued for something. 
I don't know, promoting something over something else. I feel like there's going to be a lot more hits on Sharknado after the end of the Sunset Safari. Nothing at the Salt Lick, by the way, on to more pressing matters. There's nothing. Not a single wildebeest. I'm deeply taken by surprise. And I could only assume it's because a large animal equivalent to the Lake Placid crocodile has taken residence there and scared everything off. We'll have to make a movie about that. I'm too scared to go close though, because that's... The film, everyone knows the film crew is always the first to go. We can't have that. Vim, by the way, to continue a somewhat labored subject, Vim has an entire plot line for a horror movie set in the Maasai Mara. And I cannot tell you what it is, because he would be very deeply hurt if someone were to steal his idea based on the fact that I shared it. But we have brainstormed. The time the researchers went too far. It's basically Deep Blue Sea. If you've seen Deep Blue Sea, there's one that James forgot. It's basically Deep Blue Sea, but with a different animal. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> the bizarre conversations that we have. I think if you if you could hear us some of the time, you would really seriously question our sanity. I actually have got a destination in mind, by the way, just up ahead. We have a gathering, what Archie described as a as a business meeting, and that's exactly what it looks like. A business meeting of feathered scavengers gathered together around the wildebeest-shaped conference table. A bit far away, but it'll do. It's actually so nice that my brakes don't squeak anymore. People used to be hear me hear me coming about 20 kilometers away. Now, Aaron, while we watch our vultures pick away at some unfortunate wildebeest, and on a slightly more serious and less satirical B-grade note, I don't think the the Parmalot... <laughs> Sorry. I laugh every time I say the Parmalot vulture because it's called a palm nut vulture. That's not what I'm trying to say. <laughs> that The joke about Parmalot came from our trip to Uganda last year with Rebecca and Craig and Brent and I were incredibly excited to see a palm nut vulture but they assumed that we were calling it a palmalot vulture now palmalot is a type of it's a brand in South Africa so no as far as I know the palm nut vulture which is that was very unintentional has not been seen I'm sure it's around though I mean, there are so many vultures right now, it's entirely possible. Like, it's right on the fringes. You don't, they don't occur regularly in the Mara. But it is something that we could see and have seen. But no, I haven't seen the Parmalot vulture. There we go. There's the chairman, the marabou stork. The CEO. Oh, 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 hey. Watch out. Watch it, gentlemen, please. This is a professional environment. And the Rupel's vulture chasing away the white-backed. They're just slightly bigger than the white-backed vultures, so they have a little bit of a, an advantage. I love the way they run after each other. The marabou looks like an inspector now, coming to check out their work. See if there's anything he can grab. Yep, there we go. I'll take that, thank you, while you gentlemen are otherwise occupied. Thank you very much. Now this wildebeest, probably, uh, it's hard to tell exactly why it died. Might have been injured in a crossing and only recently have the injuries fully taken effect. It could have had a broken leg that got infected. It could have been caught by a lion. Lions often abandon their kills during the migration period. They don't bother to eat them. So it could have been that. I don't think it was a hyena kill because hyenas, generally speaking, don't leave anything left behind for the other scavengers. They will eat and eat and eat and eat and eat until it's all gone. What's over there? Is that, is that just the vultures chilling out or... Yeah, I think they've eaten their full. So it could be the, the 
potential reasons for a demise could be endless. <laughs> Margarita, was that a deliberate pun? You know, is there a pecking order when it comes to vultures? I liked it if it was. Uh, probably where the, actually probably exactly where the phrase pecking order came from, come to think of it. That is a bit embarrassing. I never thought of that. Yes, there is a pecking order when it comes to the feeding hierarchy at a carcass. The biggest vulture out here, and one I tried to put on camera earlier but it flew away, is called a lappet-faced vulture, not to be confused with the leopard-faced vulture, which is not real and has been made up. Now, the lappet-faced vulture is massive with an enormously powerful bill. Unfortunately, there aren't any here. That is then followed by the Rupel's vultures and the white-backed vultures with the marabou stalk falling somewhere in that selection. But marabous aren't as mm, bulky as a vulture. So they're actually, even though they are bigger and they've got very powerful bills, they often get pushed around at kills like this, especially if they're outnumbered. And then last but definitely not least comes the little... Oh my goodness, its name's just gone out of my head. Um, toothpick vultures, small heads, tiny bulls, somebody help me, please. Um, I'm having a complete brain blank. What are they called? Hooded. <laughs> Hooded. <laughs> we'll get there eventually. My goodness, I don't know what that was. Hooded vulture. Good, good grief. The little hooded vultures that will come along and pick up the scraps and get to the bits of meat that the other vultures with their large beaks cannot get to. So that, by and large, Margarita, is the pecking order of vultures. And it is literally enforced, you guessed it, by pecking. Ah. Ah. I've been off for two drives. I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. <laughs> Katie, who is one of our 15-year-old viewers, it's wonderful to hear from you. Katie wants to know what the vultures like the best. All animals, if or, or, all meat eaters, all carnivores, if faced with an animal carcass, the best part for them is the organs, the internal organs. That's where the most nutrients are. Liver, heart, kidney, lungs, those sorts of things. That's the richest in iron, blood vessels. Uh, it's, just, it's just the best part of the meal for them. Now, for smaller species of vulture, and actually in any situation where the animal hasn't been killed by a lion or a leopard, and birds have actually moved in, the first thing to go is the eyes. Sounds grisly, sounds gruesome. It is a little grisly and gruesome, but it's just how it goes. That's the easiest part for them to get to. So while it might not be the most rewarding part in that there's, there's nutrients, but not a vast amount of nutrients from the eye, it is the easiest. It requires the least effort, so the eyes are the first to go. And then if they can, Something like a lappet faced vulture will then move in and open up the abdomen. If there's an injury, if the animal's died of an injury, that becomes a little bit easier, but it is still something that they have to work at. Animal skin is frighteningly tough. And again, their bills are suited to different things. So a hooded vulture can't go up to a carcass and tear off a big chunk of flesh. Its beak is just not big enough. It doesn't have enough strength. Whereas something like a, a Rupal's or a Lappet face can actually come and take full advantage of those strips of muscle. So it will also depend upon the vulture itself. I'm just, I, I know I've moved on, but it's because I'd like to get to, I'd like to get to Waffles before the end of the drive, just so I can see if those cubs are still alive and well. I've spoken to the researchers this morning and they say that polar bears cub, so for those of you that have kept up you'll know what I mean, for those of you that haven't don't stress it's another female hyena, she's also got a small cub and they said it was out today and suckling so it's okay but there was no sign of waffles so I just want to go and see that she's all right, that her cubs are okay. At some point I will have to sever the ties with North Clan. I will, 
but I'm not quite there yet. I'm gonna have to go see if they're okay after the rains. Okay, let's go back to a walk with Sydney through the bush. I'm trying to uh, get hold of some of the very interesting medicinal plants and some of the small animals. And here in front of me, I have got one of the interesting plants. This is what is called a Euclea divenora. This kind of a plant, if you've got it at home, it is going to bring you good luck. That is one of the beliefs associated with quite a lot of African tribes. It's one of the evergreen plants and I am just not too sure what is it that this tree is using in order to repel animals from coming to feed on it. I know the evergreen plants, they have got a very strong kind of a plastic coat here on top which then repel animals from eating on them during the dry season. But let me also get the taste. Yeah, it does taste very bad. Maybe it's one of the reasons why these animals are not coming here, because it's very much bitter. Maybe this is due to quite a whole lot of tannin on them. But something interesting about tannin is that we as human beings, we need tannin. Animals, when the tannin voltage is high, where they are feeding, it is going to constipate and they experience the digestive problems. But to us, we need tannin in order to trouble some or to, to uh, troubleshoot some of the diseases diseases such as the diabetes diabetes is one of the diseases which is caused by the problems when it comes to the processing of sugar in the body when there is those kind of problems we need to eat the trees that are rich the leaves from the trees that are rich in tannin so that we can troubleshoot those kind of a problem. I got a request earlier that some of you, my viewers, are interested to hear more about the other applications we are using when it comes to the uh, medicinal uses against the snakes. I think it is a request from Safari Sally. Yes, Safari Sally, we do have other kind of plants we are using in order to treat the snake bite. And some of them, they are occurring here in Juma Game Reserve. I always find it very much interesting to talk about a tree that you are seeing, meaning that this kind of a request, I am going to put it on hold. Soon as I come across one of the trees that we are using as a snake bite treatment, I'm going to carry on and give you more information and how we apply it. Kathy, uh, your question about the reason why the Euclea divenora is bringing good luck is that Euclea divenora is a magical plant. That is why it's called a magic plant. Guari. And if you can check its scientific name, it is called a Euclea divenora. And that divenora has got something to do with the traditional healers. It's like it's a magic tree. It's very, very much important to have this tree in the yard here in Africa. So I'm just going to try more and see if I can find other interesting things that I can share with you here. Battling too much to find the uh, to find the small things. But now, let's go to James. James, one of my colleagues, maybe at the moment, he does have something interesting. No, I don't, I'm afraid. I've come to where they last had the wild dogs. But the wild dogs appear to have absconded. And I suspect what they've done is gone to find themselves some shade in a different place from where they were this morning. Which is making me sore in my heart because I was planning on having a drive where I really didn't have to look very hard for anything. The leopards were a good start. The elephants an excellent uh, placeholder. And now I was hoping to just bumble into the wild hounds. This has not happened, unfortunately. And because we're on a major northern boundary, 
the chances of finding the tracks are slim because people drive up and down this road at a great speed and frequency. Anyway, we might be lucky. We'll drive very slowly. See if we can't pick up some tracks. There's another little road we can go down and check, which we'll do. It would be nice to get them. They are, of course, my favourite mammal out here, and it is National Dog Day in the United States. Imagine not showing you some dogs for National Dog Day. That would be a travesty. Awful tra 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 travesty. I feel it would be doubly unjust of me since I wasted your time talking about Sharknado. <laughs> Tracks. Poofy poof! Yes, wild dogs are often on the move. They are on the move crepuscularly. So just before and after dawn and just after dawn and dusk. That didn't make any sense, did it? As I was trying to concentrate on more than one thing. Yeah, I'm not sure that there's anything fresh here, Ferg, but thank you. Uh, so they're active uh, crepuscularly before dawn and after dawn and just before dusk and just after dusk. They will move pretty much in the darkness you know, from time to time, but they'll get moving sort of I suppose in about half an hour I'd expect them to get moving here. And then they could easily head north or south down towards quarantine clearings if they go south and up towards one of the water holes in Biffles Hook if they go north. That poofy poof is how they move. Exceptional name, I must keep complimenting you on your Twitter handle, poofy poof. There have been some very good ones over the years. <laughs> Kai, I'm not sure that you could describe it as stable. No, I think in my last check there were probably 300 to 350 wild dogs in the Kruger National Park. Uh, you know, that'll vary quite a lot. Uh, it's probably relatively stable, but I don't think it's... It's certainly not as high as it once was, and I suspect it could be higher. And I think the major problem is that it keeps coming into contact with domestic animals outside the fence. And it's a real disaster for wild dogs. And just There's a little road down here, which we'll go and check, see if we can't find any tracks or signs. I'm not, time, I'm not sure what time the last person to be with them left. You know, if they had just fed and they were just lying down well, then they may not have moved. No, Lindsay, that's not possible. Um, wild dogs and domestic dogs cannot interbreed. They are different species and they're not even in the same genus. So they're unable to interbreed with each other. They can, however, or are, however, susceptible to the same diseases. Canine distemper and rabies being the two that come to mind and the two that seem to be doing the most damage to the wild dog population. And of course, because we live in rural areas out here where there are absolutely no veterinary services whatsoever, thanks to the general recalcitrance of our government, you will find that, you know, these diseases just rip through the domestic stock and through the domestic dogs and then the wild dogs really don't have a chance. So there's very poor government inoculation and care of domestic animals out here. And people are too poor to do it privately. So it is a problem that is multi-pronged. But there are a lot of good people doing a lot of good work into wild dogs and their survival. And while I don't know how successful all of the efforts to conserve them are, uh, it's certainly, certainly we're getting a lot more information than ever before. Paula, there is a lot of work being done on them. Uh, the main body of work probably being done by the Endangered Wildlife Trust an exceptional South African NGO that does a lot of good work with vultures and wild dogs and cheetah. 
in this area and in other areas and they certainly seem to uh, they're the guys I think I'm pretty sure who put the collars on some of the dogs that we see quite frequently no, I still don't have any tracks here I suspect what they've done is they haven't gone very far from where they were but it just probably got a bit hot where they were and found a little bit of shade quite close by and gone to sleep I'd have to do a brief foray on foot to see if I can find them but we'll keep driving for now No, they do den, um, Christy, but they don't den like hyenas do. There's a diker over there, Fergus, if you want to show that one. Other than the back of my head, there is a diker. And the diker is gone. Yep, oh, that was a lovely sighting. Fantastic, thank you, diker. Uh, Christy, they do den, but for, temp for temporarily. They den for about three or four months at a time, just while the babies are very little, uh, probably less than four months actually, and then they move on and they become nomadic again. So they don't have a den site, a natal den, and if it's a big clan, another sort of secondary den site, as you see with the North Clan in, uh, in the Mara, and certainly as we used to see over here with our Juma clan. But they do den when the alpha female is ready to give birth and the pups are born in a den site and there they remain. I think they start moving, if I'm not mistaken, with the, with the pack at about three or four months. Alrighty, I'm going to try my level best to find these hounds. If not, we'll move on from some, to something else. Jamie has got some pigs and those pigs are doing some exercise. Uh, well, I'm trying to find you warthogs, but I have to tell you that they are now gone completely. It was a fool's mission, but I really wanted to show you something because something's very something very cool is happening in the Maasai Mara at the moment. The warthogs are having their piglets, and I've seen a few this big, and I really want to try and get them on camera for you, and I, we just haven't managed, unfortunately. They disappeared into the long grass, but it will, we'll keep trying. We know we're going to see them. And this, it's amazing. I remember from last year, I don't know if it'll be the same this year, I assume so. From last year, all of a sudden, the Masai Mara was just full of baby warthogs everywhere you looked. Most of them admittedly then got eaten, but the population must have more than doubled easily in those few weeks when those piglets stop. So we will get them on camera, it's just just a matter of time and I don't think that was our time. Uh, uh, lots of vehicles at this time of year, making roads bumpy. James, yes, there are lots of martial eagle pairs in the Mara. <coughs> the best person that we speak to with regards to martial eagles is Stratton. Now, Stratton is a dedicated martial eagle researcher and does immense amount for martial eagle conservation. Now, there is one breeding pair around Little Governors. There is one breeding pair back towards Ngirare. And the rest, I have to be honest, I'm not 100% sure where they are, but a lot of them he has actually fitted with trackers that, uh, that um, basically, let me just stop here because the noise of the road is positively overwhelming and I want to see what this, look at this baby ostrich, <laughs> look at this baby elephant chasing an ostrich. Sorry, James. Um, he fits trackers to them so he knows where they are. Sorry. End of end of discussion because I have to... <laughs> Get it! Get it! This is an ostrich! Oh! So scary! Oh, so scary! Oh, there's another one! Oh my goodness, that one's even closer! Oh yes, you're very big and very scary. We're gonna go back and chase them again. Go on. Oh goodness, I don't actually know what that one's ch what it's chasing there. I thought it was the ostriches, but it doesn't seem to be looking in their direction. Although the male ostrich appears to be responding in kind. Gulp. 
What are you doing, you crazy elephant? Mum's coming up to investigate. What have you seen? Maybe it's not an ostrich. What are you after? I think it is the o I think it is the ostrich. <laughs> I think it is. It just looks odd. It's at an odd angle somehow. But I really think now that the rest of the herd's coming in. <laughs> hey, look at this. That's incredible. Maybe this ostrich has a nest here. That's why it's so reluctant to move. It's not going to have a choice, though. If the whole herd comes around, see how it's making itself as big as possible. Unfortunately, it's up against the biggest animal on land. So that's not going to work all that well. I hope it's not a nest. That would be terribly tragic. Because there is a female nearby, and the males do sit on the eggs. Oh, Oh, so indignant. So indignant. Not very happy at all. Huh. When last did you see an elephant chase an ostrich? I can safely say I don't think I ever have. The absolute definition of feathers ruffled. Right up there with a the pecking order. Sorry, my boy. I don't think it's a nest. I think he just happened to be sitting there and now he's been forced away. That was so cool. I think you may have noticed, those of you who are sharp-eyed, that the, the one female actually had a, a short trunk. I don't know where she went. Joe! Joe! Joe, apparently you would like to know if the elephants would eat the ostrich. And the answer to that, Joe, is no. Fortunately for all of us, um, elephants are purely restricted to plant eating. You don't even see them chew bones all that often, which is a way that most herbivores get some minerals that they need. So no, luckily they would not eat the ostrich. Very lucky for us and very lucky for the ostrich, because if an elephant were to eat an ostrich, then that would mean that the elephant would eat meat. And that would really change the ball game because now we would have between two and ten tons of a very intelligent carnivore. And basically what we have there is Jurassic Park. In, or, or one of those movies that James has been describing. A carnivorous elephant is a truly terrifying thought. They're smart enough to know that we're here. They're smart enough to outsmart us at times. They've got very good senses of smell. They occasionally stalk humans on foot, regardless of whether or not they want to eat them. That's usually because they just want to squash them. Oh, there's a hyena. Hello, happy zebra. I assume this is a member of the happy zebra clan. We're quite close to their den site. Unfortunately, I, I know none of them except their matriarch, Pike. Now, just, let's just see... Um, I think it's just running to get away from the elephants, but I thought maybe it might go and investigate, because if there was a nest, it might go there, because I think that female ostrich is now chasing it. The female ostrich is chasing it. This is bizarre. What is going on? Shame. She's running in this direction. I wonder. Is she going to chase the hyena? I don't... Oh, no, she is going to chase the hyena. Chaos. April, you say that you think we found the horror movie plot with the elephants and the ostrich. Now throw a hyena into the mix. And I couldn't agree more. Shame, does she look a little anxious? Chasing away a hyena. Look, ostriches chase anything for the sake of it. Their, their brains are smaller than their eyeballs. So they really are purely instinct-based animals. I'm hoping... That there's no ne it might just be that there's a nest in the vicinity and they're just feeling particularly defensive because now the male's back again as well. Good grief! <sighs> Somebody treating the reserve as a Formula One track. Shame, look, he does look very disgruntled. And so does she. Well, perhaps... 
They are two loves kept apart by elephants, which is the equivalent in the Maasai Mara of star-crossed lovers. Oh, shame, he really does look unhappy. Oh! Instead <laughs> of being very brave and displaying, It's so hard to gauge exactly where it might be. Oh, now the hyena's whooping. It's absolute chaos here. Such a nondescript patch of land I was about to drive past. I don't think you can hear that, unfortunately. Most likely a clan male, but not necessarily. I'm just very, those were very soft whoops as well. And probably a male. They do make most of the territorial whoops, but it could easily be a female as well. Definitely a happy zebra, though. I mean, for those of you that for whom that makes absolutely no sense, because we're looking at a hyena, this particular clan is called the Happy Zebra Clan. I didn't name them. Let's have a look, sorry, let's go back to the ostriches just to see if he sits down again or she sits down again. They seem to be a bit more relaxed now that the elephants have passed. Hmm. Counting eggs? Making sure they're all there? Or just scratching the back of his head? Looks like he's counting eggs, but he's scratching the back of his head. Nina Moo, why do ostriches have bald necks? I would say that the most, the primary purpose is thermoregulation. It gets very hot where ostriches live and they're big birds. The bigger something is, the more of a mission it is to cool down, um, just due to surface area to volume ratio. So for them it might be, or it will be a way of thermoregulating or losing heat rather than having all of their, um, their body, their skin covered in feathers so that they've actually got nowhere to lose that excess heat. And they'll often sit right in the blazing sun in the desert. It might not be that hot in the Mara, but in the deserts of Botswana, on the salt plains, it does get very hot indeed. The males, of course, can flush. Uh, they flush their necks pink, particularly in breeding season, although I've noticed that in, in the ostriches in the Mara, they're pretty much pink-necked all the time. They seem to be in a permanent state of excitement around the females. That's where he was when we first saw that elephant chasing him. So I think that must be where that nest is, if there is a nest. I could be wrong about that. Unfortunately, there's absolutely no way for me to go and check. So fascinating. Elephants chasing ostriches, ostriches chasing hyenas. Luckily, no elephants eating ostriches, because then we would have been really in trouble. And then I would have had to eat my own words and then run away from the carnivorous elephants. I still think that's very much Jurassic Park. Um, gonna, am I going to make it? I've got an hour left. It's far. Yes, I can make it. I can make it if... If I try. You can all jump on board with me and just hold on. We're going to try and get to the wafflets. Uh, oh, but we're not going to... I'm going to frighten the hyena slightly. Sorry, boy. Have fun. I've never... I haven't been to the Happy Zebra Den. I have absolutely no idea what Kirsty just said, but I'm sending you somewhere to look at something, I think. Oh, I've got some of the little holes here. I'm just trying to check who stays in here 
Father, I cannot see a lot of evidence, but considering the shape of these holes, is telling me that these are the bee eaters. If not the bee eaters, must be the kingfishers. So these are bird nests. Some of these birds, they nest up in trees, and some of them, they come here by the dry river beds. As well as the active river beds, you will see these holes there. So that is where they go and they lay their eggs and incubate in there, have babies, and then release them. The interesting part about these beds is that these beds, they don't get lost. They always know where home is. But if you can check, up here in the air, we don't have any roots. It's not like on the ground where we can be able to read the maps. But these birds, because they don't have much activities to do every day, all they are doing every day is to go for foraging and is mating and look after their babies. So, and that helps them in order to learn to investigate a lot, in order to navigate a lot. So when these birds are every time flying up in the air, they can be able to distinguish and learn easily and imprint their route back home. And they can fly long distances. Imagine the birds that are now in Europe as the result of different kind of migration migrations they will come back to the Juma Game Reserve and some of them they are going to reside by the very same trees and some they even use some of their old nest they just have to come renovate them and use them whereas some of them are going to build new nest so you can see these birds they are so very much well gifted and I like their GPS system It's very quiet here, where I am, I cannot see these birds. Uh, the, the plant that helps when it comes to the eyesight, it is the silver cluster leaf. When you've got problems in the eyes, you have to take the roots and you infuse that roots, use that water as an eye wash, and then you're going to have a better sight. Not too sure if that will be permanently or else is something that you've got to do frequently. Sam, the things such as a tokolosh, it is unfortunate that where I come from, we don't have those kind of things. But yes, here in Africa, uh, in particular South Africa, we do have some of the tribes that believe on things such as tokolosh. So unfortunately, in Venda, we don't have tokolosh. We don't believe on tokolosh. So a, a, a tokolosh, I am not very sure what kind of an animal it is, but I have heard that is something that causes quite a lot of problems. But in Venda, they are anti anti tokolosh plants. So some of the people who are experiencing problems with tokolosh is from different tribes. They come to Venda as well in order to be assisted to chase away those kind of, of, of spirits. So now, while I'm trying to look for other small things, let's see, James is busy trying to find you the wild dogs. Yeah, I failed to find them and I've just chatted to Rex on the radio and there were a whole lot of them calling around the camp late this morning or late-ish this morning and I wonder if these guys didn't go and try and find those guys or there's just insufficient shade here and they've moved into a shadier area. So we're going to go down towards the waterhole near camp, see what's going on there and then we'll probably make our way back to the Lepards as the day starts to draw to a close along with the week bringing the week to a close, of course. Anyway, that's what we're doing now. I do apologize for my incompetence at finding them. We even stuck a little drone into the air to see if we could see them, but alas, we could not. I don't know where they've gone. Still very few signs of spring just yet, but the knobthorn trees around camp have started to flower, which is very nice.
casting a gentle and honeyish scented air around the place. It mingles quite nicely with a septic tank outside my window. <laughs> Couldn't resist that, sorry. <laughs> It's not too bad, I promise. <laughs> right, let's find some biology. There's a stony silence from the final control at the moment. I believe, um, as I got off the car to go and look for the wild dogs on foot, Fergus says to me, the hyenas are chasing, what, the ostrich is chasing the hyena? That's not something you say every day, really. It's not something you hear someone say every day. It's not something you see every day. Ostriches chasing hyenas. Must have been quite fun. Elephants chasing ostriches. Anyway, I haven't seen anything like that over here. Ah. Weekend escape, you're wondering about salt licks and whether Juma has any salt licks on it or not. Uh, no, there are no salt licks that are uh, unman-made, or there are no man-made salt licks, sorry. There are some areas that have uh, sodic soil, so they're clay-rich and they retain quite a lot of salt, and those areas are on the rivers, so as soon as you get near a river, there's a gen general sort of movement of clay down the slope towards the rivers, and there you will find soil that animals certainly do uh, eat from time to time especially at this time of the year when they're a bit short of nutrients and you'd call that a sodic area and uh, yeah I've tried to eat it I've tried to uh, taste any sort of salt in it failed dismally it's a little bit like eating beach sand which of course is uh, well not delicious likewise the sand that the termites put on the trees is a hugely uh, edible thing for a lot of people out here, but uh, I've never managed to uh, stomach it. That'd be another interesting one to ask Sydney, actually. I forgot to ask him. Ask him if he eats the termite sand. I think there's some dog tracks on the road here, which is quite nice. That's quite exciting. Paula, no. Wild dogs are, unlike leopards and unlike hyenas, they are sort of, not suspicious of, but they will try and avoid human beings more than those two creatures will. We've had them very, very close to camp before. We've had them coming right past the tent. We've had them coming right past the entrance to the camp. And so they, they will come close to camp. But I don't think you'll find they would ever actually come into it unless they got sort of lost as these ones certainly do. There was that mournful wailing this, uh, this morning when I woke up and that was not the sound of uh, any of the crew sporting vicious hangovers after their rap party last night, but that of a wild dog calling, trying to locate its friends. Ah, oh, here are some impala. Let's stop and give them a little bit of consideration, given that I haven't shown you any animals for some time. Hello. You definitely wouldn't be looking quite as cheerful as you are if you'd seen a wild dog, I bet you. No, you wouldn't. You can see the light is now starting to soften beautifully. Very nice relaxing Sunday scene of impala grazing, somehow managing to derive nutrients from these uh, dry conditions. I suspect they've just been for a drink at the Gallagher waterhole. They're all sort of heading out of that area. Yes, that's you I'm talking about. Quite surprised, aren't you? Mm-hmm very surprised all the time are oh, impalas they have to be oh my goodness Tristan is about to do his second segment of the afternoon let's go across to him immediately well we are James and we're doing it with 
one thing that we don't really see very often staying for long periods of time and that's birds and so really nice to have a little flock of guinea fowls that have come down for a late evening drink they are birds that do drink quite regularly and we see them fairly often around quarantine in the dam area and they kind of scuttle about looking for food and like i say every now and then we'll come in for a drink and they generally are in quite big groups together this one is only the three that i can see so far there's the king of the castle now it's decided i'm going to sit on top it would be interesting to see if it actually started to call now of course we don't have audio on the nest cams but it would be interesting to see if it beaks move if the beak moves while it's sitting on top there because often when birds go onto a ridge like this especially ground dwelling birds this is a place that they'll end up making a territorial call or just vocalizing to let everybody know that they're in charge but you can see there's quite a few of them actually kind of coming out from behind that mound and they hopefully are all going to come and start drinking they're an incredible bird though we don't you know we obviously see them quite often and very regularly just drive past them because they are quite common but they really are very very unique looking with that big helmet that is on top hence the name helmeted guinea fowl and then the very bright colors as opposed and quite interesting patterned feathers oh there's a bit of stretching going on it's yoga it's yoga at the dam this afternoon with the one on the right who's having a little wing stretch and leg stretch now chris you say it's african chickens yes they are but like african chickens aren't they they're, they're about as bright as chickens too i will say one thing though they are quite valuable for us out here because they're quite a reliable bird for alarm calls so when you hear these guys alarm calling you know that there is something around the problem is is that they will alarm call for birds of prey as well but you will see them alarm calling for leopard and lions and wild dogs and all those kind of things so they're actually not the worst thing to have around because they're pretty keen sighted and if you find them flying up into the tree and alarm calling well then you know very quickly that there is something around the thing is though there is also a time in the year where they do make a lot of noise that sounds like alarm calls but that's during their breeding period and that's normally sort of summertime so early summer you find these guys make quite a racket but very very cool to see and you know you would never really get this normally because they're quite skittish so even if we were sitting there in a vehicle i don't think they would actually drink if we were there anyway we'll keep watching we'll keep seeing what's coming down i'm hoping for a dog or a cat that will come down in the late afternoon sun and so while we wait patiently let's send you back across to sydney who's once again looking at the smaller things on bushwalk I have got one of the very most interesting animals. This is an arachnid. I have got a spider right in the hole. I can't see the spider, but let's look where the spider is staying. If you can check here, you'll see there's a very tiny little hole. And this little hole is plastered. You can see the inner part is, is clustered. So this baboon spider is making sure that these kind of soils doesn't enter there. So it's very much clean. So the spiders that have to hunt for feeding purposes, they have to also use a strategy in order to protect themselves during these hunting activities. Here is where the story is going to get very interesting. These spiders, they come out, and when they are hunting, they must have to secrete a silk. And when they secrete this silk, this silk serve as a net behind them in order to catch those other insects that are trying to get hold of them. So the silk is not only used in order to build the spider web, it's also used for communication purposes. When it comes to the demarcation of territories, the spiders, they use silk. And also the females in order to show to the males that they are sexually active they must have to give out a pheromone coming out with the silk and the males they must come and smell it and from smelling the silk males are going to know how many previous partners ex-partners the female had before them and the interesting part is these males some of them if they are not happy with what has been happening previously after mating, they can also produce their own silk in order to seal the copulatory organ of the female, which is called an epigynum. So they are going to make sure that no other spiders come and mate with them after them. So that is very interesting, amazing. Small, small things, they are so very creative and they can be very much proactive. So I'm going to look more for other interesting things. Now, let's go to uh, Jemmy. She has got a very lovely giraffe and see how the giraffe is doing in Mara. 
Jamie with the giraffe and some somewhat disappointing news. I'm sorry, I can't go to Waffles' den today. The uh, There are currently other people there, so we're going to give them their space and allow them to do their thing because we are not the only people who find North Clan fascinating to film. So for now we're going to look at this giraffe and I've asked my researcher friends to get back to me once they know that Waffles' cubs are safe and well. Beautiful specimen. I know this giraffe. I see him often on this road. I think he likes this area. Giraffe are not strictly territorial, but I see this giraffe. He's a very distinctive, very white face, obviously with spots on it, and then very, very dark spots. I'm pretty sure it's the same one that I see all the time. You know, after a while, these animals start to look familiar. Each and every single giraffe has a unique spot pattern like a leopard, or a hyena, or zebra stripes. It is completely unique to them. And we do occasionally get to know individual giraffe. He looks like he's got a, a sideways letter K on his neck there behind his ear. That would be quite a useful identifying feature. And I find it very easy with Maasai giraffe in particular, like this male, because their spots are so artistic. Honestly, they really, I mean, nature has provided the most incredible looking texture to their skins. It is so, so beautiful. One spot looks like a flower and one spot looks like a butterfly. This is basically like looking for patterns in clouds, only, only for, for on giraffe skin. They do look like puzzle pieces. Or like dried mud that's cracked. Uh-oh. Poof! <laughs> We're in trouble! <laughs> that was a full-on dust storm, but what the reason I'm saying we're in trouble is that 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 is going to be here very, very soon. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to, I'm really sorry, we're gonna have to cover up I, now. I just need to get off the road. Woof! that hit hard. There's just this wall of wind. Oof. We're gonna batten down the hatches and the rest of this the rest of this drive is going to be intense. Uh -huh. Let's go to James who has some elephants for you. Here we have some elephant and there is no intensity uh, being displayed here by the weather other than the slight heat I suppose we're having to deal with but that's not too bad at all. It's very pleasant. It's very pleasant here where we are sitting with the elephants. We are sort of on our way back towards the leopards. I'm kind of hoping the wild dogs will arrive and emerge at some stage. That's why I'm lingering slightly around the water holes. But then we will go back to the Lepards. But enjoying a little standoff here between two elephants. They were having a little tiff over the bush that they're eating. Ooh, that is the sound of the golden-tailed woodpecker. Sounds a little bit like Geraldine Kent when she's alarmed after a rap party. <laughs> Now, can we go to the thermal camera? Can we go to the FLIR? There we've got the FLIR thermal camera showing you the heat of the elephant. Shut up. Isn't that nice? Such a lovely picture. Little bit of irritation being shown by the calf you can see there trying to suckle. Crafty elephant herds in Juma don't really exist. Now I don't mean that to be a facetious answer but they roam so widely that to say whether or not they're increasing at Juma or not is impossible. Are they increasing in the Kruger National Park which is the greater ecosystem that we're part of? Yes absolutely they are. Uh, I don't think they're in any difficulty at all. There are still those that debate whether or not there are too many or too few. Uh, but I think what you'll find is that uh, at Juma, 
you know, they're no more or less than they would be uh, at any other time of, uh, or any other season around about this time. They come in, they're here for a while, and then they disappear. Juma is about 1,200 hectares. It's about two and a half thousand, well, yeah, two and a half thousand uh, acres, almost 3,000 acres. And the elephants, you know, in terms of a home range, they've got home ranges already 10 times that size. So the numbers on Juma vary from zero to probably, I don't know, around about a hundred sometimes. But otherwise their populations are in a good way, I would say, here in the Kruger National Park. So I've missed the migration this year in the Mara. I'm, uh, in a piece of me is quite sad that I wasn't there. But I'm not sad to have missed all that rain. Let's go across to Sidders, who has arrived back from work and said, Whew, it's hot today. Look at that phenomenal sunset. This is beautiful. I missed Juma Game Reserve. I haven't seen this kind of a sunset for the past uh, 14 consecutive days. It's my first day today to see this lovely sunset. So the sun, when it's doing like this, is reminding me of the stories about while I was still very young. So we used to cook uh, from the wood and, you know, building and starting the fire, it takes time. And for us, in order to warm the food, we used to put all the plates outside by the sun in the morning especially if it's meat, so that the sun can at least warm them. But sometimes dogs, they used to steal my food while I'm in the hut uh, when the sun is busy trying to prepare them for me. So every time I see the sun like this, all those stories, they start to come back. And it, it works. The sun can warm the food very much nicely. So I, I just heard some of the birds interesting birds. I hear quite a lot of pale spotted owl calls. So now I can see when the sun is going down, the interesting nocturnal life is going to take place. And hopefully before we get back to the camp, we might see maybe any of these interesting cats. As where I come from when I was on off days, I, I missed all these animals. I haven't seen any of those birds. It will be the first time after uh, two weeks to see some of the owls. Interesting, lovely animals. So now, let's see. James is now heading to the leopards. Not too sure which leopard. Tingana and Hosanna, that is where we are going now. They're not far from where they were. We'll head in there and see if we can't see them. Given up on the dogs. Jamie's probably out of the rest of the show because she'll be about to drown in the Marsi Mara. As I was saying, although I don't, I don't miss the, those storms, especially as when I was there, we didn't have the proper rain covers, and so you just were going to get wet. There was nothing to be done about it. Um, I did enjoy, once you had battened down the hatches, sitting there listening to the rain and having a cup of coffee and a biscuit or a sandwich, something like that. I always found that very comforting most enjoyable and then to open up the sides afterwards and see the freshness of the bush outside. A great privilege to have been in the Masi Mara. And hopefully again at some stage. There goes a Franklin. I'm not going to stop for it. We're going to carry on towards the leopards. Vroom vroom. Apparently during our TV show, my use of the term Ferrari Safari was an enormous hit. I'm not really sure why, uh, but apparently that was very popular. Hmm? Everyone likes, rhyme. everyone likes a rhyme. Thank you, Fergus. Fergus says it's because everyone likes a rhyme. Yes. We are not Ferrari Safariing now, we are just gently moving. It's got a little bit cooler now. I must say, I, it, this time of the year, leading up into the summer proper, is difficult because the body does take a while to adjust 
and as I say spring lasts 12 hours here and then it's summer there is no time for it to adjust it's just cold one day 12 hours of warmth and then just hot No, Minamu, there's not a huge amount of fluctuation in the weather during spring, except for the fact that, but I suppose between September and December, we still have frontal weather where the fronts will come through and you, yeah, you can get two or three days of, oh, I mean, I wouldn't say cold, but of miserable weather. Yeah, that does happen, in fact, at this time of the year. September to November-ish, before the proper rains start. And it can get a little bleakish. And then you get this very hot, dry stuff. Now we're coming down into the valley of the Great Mluamati. Oh, I can see some lights. Not sure why we need lights on the leopards just yet, given that it's broad daylight. But, you know, call me conservative. Nearly there. Alrighty, let's get in here. Engage a slightly different gear to allow for off road driving. Here we go, everybody. I hope you're ready. This is where Hosanna was sleeping on his food at the end of the TV show on Saturday where he was lying on a piece of steak then he ate it it's quite funny probably had to be there though all right now all right let's try and get into a good position while we do that Tristan has yet another sighting We do indeed. This is not a cat or a dog yet, but we do have the obligatory Nyala that does enjoy its time at the pan, and they come around this time most days. It's actually quite interesting to see that they kind of wander in very late in the afternoon, just as the sun is set. You can see them kind of moving around there. So there's a female that's just walked off to the left, and then there's a big male that's hanging around in amongst, well, Hosanna's little sleeping patch. So Hosanna's not going to be not very happy about his house being trimmed away and making him more exposed. I'm sure he, when he gets back, he'll have a word with that Nyala. I wonder if it's maybe the same Nyala that he chased a few days ago that's getting its revenge by getting rid of where Hosanna likes to hide away and stalk them. But and really nice to kind of see so many Nyalas around. We, you know, since I've been watching this nest cam, you actually get a feel for how many there are. There's lots and lots, particularly of these big males that wander through and have a little drink from time to time. They just really kind of spend quite a bit of time around the lodge itself. And so I think they come here because they know the lodge is quite safe to spend the night in and then at this time of the day drink and then off to go and get some safety. Now it's amazing also their camouflage. I know this is obviously quite far away from the camera, but when you look at that, it's very difficult to actually see him in amongst the thickets. So that chocolate brown coloration really does work when it comes to hiding out and camouflaging in amongst bushes and, and thickets and those little white bits just also break up the outline and make it very difficult to actually see them. I was hoping he was going to come and drink, but it seems as though he's going to probably wander off down the bank and, and carry on with his day. There was a dove that flew past as well. Anyway, we'll sit here for a while longer and it sounds like James talking about Hosanna has actually caught up with him once again. We have caught up with him. There he is. There's Hosanna. He's asleep. But I can't figure out what's played out here. Tingana is now further from the tree than he is. Neither, neither of them are in the tree. Oh, there's Tingana. He's right. Oh, oh, okay, I see what's happened here. I've got a little bit disorientated. Let me move back a little bit and you can see him. Okay, can you see him there? He is basically um, straight through there. Yeah, if you look there, go left a bit, left a bit, and zoom in there. No, um, right, come back out. 
So if you you see that that tree there, that funny thin tamburti in front of us, if you just go to the left of that, why can't I see the tree I'm looking at? Go down a bit and back out a little bit. Sorry, I will find him for everybody. Back out a bit, zoom out. Um, right. I, oh, I see the problem. Okay. Yeah, we can't see him yet. Okay, we'll get into a proper position here. Uh, while we do that, let's go across to Jamie, who has got a waterbuck and a scene that has been described as nothing short of beautiful. Awesome. So while James re repositioned, we've got a scene in front of us uh, that makes my reaction from earlier look like a complete overreaction because uh, to the west of us, the sun is shining beautifully and backlighting these lovely fluffy waterbuck for us. Now, on one side of us, it looks absolutely amazing to the west of us. To the east of us, however, something seriously wicked this way comes. I'll show you in a little bit, but let's enjoy. Oh, wait, hold on. I can't show you right now. It, you sort of have to look through. Can you see through there? Oh, oh I know what you can see. Wait, there's one more coming. Oh, there we go. The speed that these clouds are moving, it's coming for us in a big way. But I've managed to leave one side of the vehicle uncovered so that we can actually see. See the, how the, the tree is blowing? Our rain covers, which are held down on our vehicles with bungee cords and hooked, this is with the window open and it is pushing against the side of the car. I can actually feel Mila struggling as I drive her and this windscreen is pushing up. The bungee cords are really pulling. I think it would be possible for us to be blown over. I'm just going to go forward a bit so that Archie's got another view of the water buck. I think it would be possible for us to be blown over. Surely not. It's a big heavy car. It is top heavy though. Uh, here we go. Here's our water bucks. Lovely. This is very beautiful. Backlit and peaceful. Normally I'd say let's sit and listen to the sound of the wilderness, but it's just wind. Dehug, you say that you much prefer the water buck in South Africa. Um, that's fair, I guess. These guys, there is a difference. These guys have got a an almost russet colour to their coats. The Defusser water buck. So they do, they do have a slightly different colour, and of course, what makes the the waterbuck in South Africa so charming and appealing is that white ring around their bottoms, which these waterbuck don't have. They've got a, a solid white patch on their butts, and that is very different to the the South African waterbuck. What that reasoning is, or why why it is that that is the way it is, I'm not a hundred percent sure. These are definitely more red in colour. I personally think they're just as fluffy and just as adorable. They've still got the heart-shaped nose of a waterbuck and those delicate features. I don't know if they smell as much because it's so open here that we're not, we often, I don't think I've ever actually smelt the waterbuck here. The wind is always blowing it away. Okay, fair. I mean, you are more than entitled to prefer the waterbuck here in South Africa. I'm not sure that I have a strong opinion either way. I think this is beautiful, though. That much I can say. Lovely. Very soon we will have to fully batten down the hatches, but we'll struggle on till the very last moment to avoid that. James has managed to move around. Let's see what view of Tingana he's managed to find. Well, pretty much the standard view of Tingana after a meal, fast asleep. He is right underneath the kill tree now. There it is. A large piece of Nyala still hanging in the boughs. 
Mmm. Doesn't that look appetizing, everybody? Sunday afternoon roast. Yum, yum. Anyway, young, young, young Tingana, old Tingana is definitely in a state of deep repose right now, and I'm not sure that anything's going to rouse him. And then his son, if I can get my fat bonce out of the way, not far looking on in a well, I think that you could easily describe that as mm, jealous hunger. Bill, Hosanna and Tingana, this is interesting, here we go, are about, uh, how far from camp, about a mile as the crow flies? Yeah, about 1.6 k's, so not too far. This isn't a massive property, remember. We're never more than 10 or 15 minutes away from home, unless we're at the far end of Chitwa. He's moving slowly closer. I will tell you what to... Oh, come on now. Leopards do not subscribe to the adage, fortune favours the brave. Because uh, death often gets the brave out here. Very nice. There he's heads up now. I'm just listening to the radio quickly. Sorry, that's why I've gone silent. Look, oh, he's coming. He's coming now. This is wonderful stuff. That's what happens here. Look at him approaching with his head down. No, Tingana's not tolerating this. He is not tolerating that at all. He's going to go up the tree. It's very interesting, this. It's fascinating. He is not prepared to share for any money. He also doesn't want to really go up there because it's a very uncomfortable tree, but he's prepared. He's prepared not to. No, because I don't think an under a scheduled broadcast here, I don't think Horsana's going to approach again and we can't see him properly. It is fascinating, this. He's too, he's too fat and too uncomfortable to go up there. He's getting very irritated with Hosanna, who is now not moving. Hosanna's just lying down, looking sad, really. I suspect this has been going on all day long. Every time Hosanna gets hungry enough to get up and come and have a look, his father does this. You'll hear him growling. And I'm sorry about the other vehicle moving around there, obviously just trying to get a bit of you. So he was ready to go up there and protect it. Very special and very interesting that Osana isn't thinking about trying to take his father on physically. There will come a time if Hosanna doesn't leave this area, that that will happen, that the tables will turn. That is inevitable. Or that they will come to blows. So I, I almost feel like, although this is a fantastic thing to be watching, males and females, and, you know, young male here interacting with his father, although I find it utterly compelling and utterly amazing, there's a piece of me that feels a little bit anxious about it. Because if Tingana loses condition and Hosanna, you know, gets six months bigger than he is now, now, with six months more, 
adolescent testosterone in him. It's difficult to know how he will react to a situation like this. Sloop, I don't know why he doesn't go off and find something else to eat, I guess. But he's full, so he's not starving. He's eaten this thing for 24 hours. There's still meat here. Now, it's quite possible Tingana will drop some onto the ground, so a little bit like a hyena. Maybe he's waiting to see if he can get some. It's energetically efficient for him to wait here and see if he can't get something that he's already killed because he's full. If he was very hungry, I suspect he'd move off. Now, let's see if he goes up. Isn't it interesting, though, how different the two of them look now that you've seen their two faces so close up? You can see that Tingana is much older, much more grizzled. Torn ears, scars on his face. Fascinating stuff. I don't think he'd be anywhere near thinking about going up that tree right now if it wasn't for his son. Here he goes. Up you go, lazy bones. A lot of people watching you, waiting to see your climbing prowess. He keeps grunting in irritation, so he wouldn't be going up if it wasn't for the fact that Hosanna was there trying to steal from him. Isn't that special? We've gone to infrared, you can see. Have we? Yeah. No. Have we? Yeah. No. Yeah. no it's just a, a <laughs> just a dull day. <laughs> Thought we'd lost the colour there. So this is not a comfortable tree for him to be in. It's not a comfortable tree for him to lie in or feed in. But he's going to make the best of it. How he fits anything else into that fat belly, I'm really not sure. Here comes a hyena now. Hyena coming down. Now see how the leopard doesn't react to the hyena at all. There's something on the ground there. Doesn't react to him at all. And simply, here comes another hyena, and it's simply because he knows that, of course, the hyenas cannot climb. quite an amusing scene while this is going on I'm watching two vehicles full of photographers third hyena coming in now now let's go to the thermal camera now third hyena made its way in oh we go anyway in the photography vehicles there are five or six extremely long and expensive lenses and one woman using her cell phone to take pictures it's, she'll probably get the best shots Very powerful jaws tearing to pieces, I think, what was a piece of the rib cage. Tingana is struggling a little bit to feed. No, he's not, he's actually fine, he's feeding with these. But these chaps have obviously been quite close by since Tingana killed this thing, and they are the only reason he put it up in the, into this tree. In fact, since Hosanna killed it. And they were here yesterday morning, very early, when we arrived for the TV show. And they were looking very hopeful, but they got nothing. Kai Hosan is just lying there. I can you even see him, Ferg? He's just in the bush there. One of the hyenas going towards him now. 
I can't move what well, I can, but it's not going to help us see him. I think let's go back to Tingana now, who is trying desperately to balance and eat at the same time. Getting some nice things to eat. And delicious food. Rotting nyala. Mmm. Alright, let's go to the Fleer thermal camera once more. It really does give such a lovely perspective of things, I think. And interesting how on a hot day like this, an exposed tree like that gets as hot as the mammal does which I think is fascinating. <laughs> and I know that many of you very much enjoy the Fleer look. You can see not much heat coming off. In fact, <laughs> there's less heat coming off his roast lunch than there is off the tree. That is unsurprising, of course, it's because his lunch has been dead for 48 hours. But it hasn't absorbed anything like the amount of heat that the tree has. Ferg, at what stage do we go to infrared? Um, we're all right for now. Ah, now thank you, Crystal. You say we've got Corky, oh, just sorry, it's Corky and Tima and Hart, is that correct? Yeah, Corky and Tima and Tart, or Hart, Tart or Hart? Hart, Gwen's daughter Hart. So they're all part of the Juma clan of hyenas. That's very interesting. Now, while we've got Crystal on the line, she's obviously a huge hyena expert, um, I cannot remember which hyena's got the glassy eye. Do you remember? There's one of them that's got a glassy eye was here the whole of Saturday morning. I don't know if she's here now. We will wait for an answer. Yeah, we're going to go into infrared. Here we go. Whew. Look at that. We might have to stay with just me until the end of the drive. Well, luckily I'm not on my own. I've got three hyenas and two leopards with me. Uh, obviously it's now dark enough for Bushwalk to have gone back home. And it is too rainy for Jamie to unbatten her hatches and stare out into the Mars Imara. I hope you won't object too much to being with three hyenas and two leopards. Right, we're going back to the Flier. And you can see where they're well insulated and where they're poorly insulated. And, and we're looking at Corky and Antima right now. Corky, do you know which one has got the... Uh, not Corky, Crystal, do you know which one's got the glassy eye? Right, so it was Comet, a male. Yes, I'm glad I thought I thought it was the male. I couldn't remember the name though. It was Comet who had a glassy eye, and he was here on Friday, on yesterday morning. So he's left now, obviously, he's gone foraging somewhere else. And part of the same clan these ones are, and they've come in hoping for some snack to fall from the tree. So that's Corky there that you're looking at. As far as I remember, a relatively high-ranking member of the Juma clan of hyenas. And she's named Corky because of the way she used to sit in the termite mound den. She'd plug up the hole like a cork. <laughs> ah. Okay, take care. Uh, are we going to let's go back to the flier? What we're looking at here, 
uh, take care is a difference in heat. So the darker the picture, like the nose there, you can see the nose of Corky, is deep black almost, a sort of indigo black. That means it's the coldest part of the picture you're looking at. Then the whitest part is the hottest part. Now, this camera can tell you what heats those are, but you can set them, if I'm correct. Is that correct, Fergus? So we'll change a setting now. But basically, the whiter it is, the hotter it is. And so you can see there that the hottest part of the screen is 37.2 degrees Celsius. Uh, that is about a nine... Oh, you, your thing cuts it off. Okay. So I will tell you that the hottest part of this is 37.2, which is roughly 98 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And the coldest part would be, I suppose, uh, I'm not sure what it would be, but anything below, say, 25, maybe less, 20. Right, okay. Ah. There's Corky staring up, hopefully. And I'm afraid I think Tingana is wily enough not to drop too much. Osana is looking on in depression. He's lying not more than three meters from Ntima, I think it was. He's just gone up and lain down. And so we have a standoff. Tingana secure in the tree. Yes, I think that's a very good idea, Joanna. Tungana needs to drop a meat pillow down for his son so that he can have a nap on it. Unfortunately, I think you'd find Corky would eat his meat pillow very quickly. Devour it in seconds, and then poor old Hosanna would be without a pillow and a meal. Ah, now, from tomorrow, everybody, I, we, the drives will be changing. Thank you, Paula, for reminding us to remind you. There is a blog post out about it, if you don't remember the numbers. But here they come. From tomorrow, because the TV show's over, and because we're heading towards the springtime, we'll be live at 5.30 Central African time, and we will be closing down at 8.30 Central African time. So you'll have a three-hour morning broadcast until, as far as I'm aware, the 29th of September or so, when it will shift again. But I will we'll tell you about that closer to the time. And then the afternoon safari will remain... No, are we changing that as well tomorrow? We are, aren't we? Kirsten, are we changing tomorrow's afternoon safari? We are. That's what I thought. We will be going out at 3.30 Central African time and returning at 6.30 Central African time. Because, as you can see, well, you can't really see it, we're in infrared, but it's not dark yet. We're only 10 minutes from the end of drive. Yeah, there you are. That's how dark it is. So it's not very dark at all without the infrared on. It doesn't look very nice, but it's still not very dark. And it's also getting a bit hot during the afternoon. Correct, Paula. Sunrise Drive will be half an hour, well, it'll be an hour earlier than you've been experiencing it for the last little while. It'll be three hours from 5.30 to 8.30. And I believe a number of you are very happy that it's going to be three hours again. Well, you know, we do aim to please. I know it was a little frustrating for some of you over the course of the TV show that we only had two hours. But we had to learn to fly the thermal drone. And I must just reiterate again that uh, the unsung heroes of our TV show were Sebastian the drone pilot, Fergus the other drone pilot and ultimately patient cameraman on the drone car and the Volv, Steve Orval. And the three of them without whom we would have got probably 10% of the live content that we did. Anyway, now we're back to normal. 
Come October, we will be doing some more drone tests, we think, um, but that'll be only twice a week. But we'll tell you about that closer to the time, because between you and I, I'm pretty sure we'll forget about it until it actually happens. All right, let's go back to the Flier cam. Tingana somehow is managing to shove more into his fat sausage belly. Why can't he see Hosanna properly? Can he, oh, let's look at him with the Flier. If we can find him. Um, he should be there somewhere. Somewhere around there. Yeah. Uh -huh. There he is. Oh, climb. Unquestionably, Dr. Mark, if a lion attacks a leopard, his safest option is to climb, not run. Lions are fast. And, you know, if you were to put them in a sprint over about 20 meters, I think you'll find the leopard would win. But after that, the lion's big strides, I think, would haul in a leopard quite quickly. The so lion can tend to look quite heavy and quite lumbering sometimes, but they are immensely quick. Oh, pug marker, and it's not impossible that wild dogs should pick up, pitch up here. Um, if wild dogs pitched up here, they would uh, send Hosan scuttling up the tree. The hyenas would group and probably give them a bit of uphill. The dogs would quickly see there was nothing much going on here and they'd disappear. So I think that's what would happen if wild dogs arrived here. There seems to be a little bit of confusion about the timings. Um, on the blog post. Anyway, all you need to do is know that it is going to be an hour earlier tomorrow morning and half an hour later in the afternoon. That's all you need to remember. You can set your watch by that. Or your grandfather clock or however it is that you tell the time. A nice picture of our leopard enjoying his meal. Like I say, it's not dark yet. It's still completely seeable with the naked eye, but it's not great without our infrared. The infrared gives a much nicer picture. Um, Barbara, I do think that Hosanna will be as big as Tingana one day. I don't think he'll be bigger. I think he'll probably be of a size. He's almost as tall. He's not quite as thick set yet as Tingana. His head will get bigger. The neck muscles around his neck will get bigger. Uh, he'll fill out in general a bit more than he has. He's always been quite stocky. Never been very tall. And I think that he will turn into roughly the same size leopard as Tingana. If you see them together, you can see how much bigger Tingana is. If you see them separately, uh, it's difficult to tell. Tingana is quite a lot bigger still. And like I say, he brings his 12 years of experience to bear in any potential conflict situation, which is why, of course, he's eating the Snyala and Hosanna is not. Here comes another Misi, Hyena. I think it's Ntima returning. Very cold patch on her back, that's interesting. Is that a wound? No. That's a leaf. No, it's not. It's a part of her it's a part of her part of her fur. You can see that cold patch there underneath her spine. Well maybe it's just wet, maybe she rolled in it in something or other. Uh, do leopards smell, Gabby? I mean, do you mean, do they exude an odour? Uh, they don't exude an odour, certainly not one that I can discern. Hyenas, on the other hand, exude a dreadful odour. They are very smelly creatures indeed. They smell like 
mm, carcass basically. They smell like a sort of sickly sweet carcass mixed with a bit of dog. They are rank and I think Jamie will probably give you a much better description of their stink because she's of course spent hours and hours with the North Clan of Hyenas but they definitely have a really woeful odour about them. It's because they don't care. They don't need to be scentless like the leopards do. I've also never been able to smell a lion so I've obviously had both kinds of cats walking past me very close by and I've never managed to smell either of them. I think they are both without scent largely. All right, everyone, that is going to be it for the sunset safari. We'll give you a last look at Tingana, the male leopard, before we leave him. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for your questions and your comments on this lovely, lovely Sunday afternoon from the Mara and, of course, from South Africa. Remember, tomorrow, one hour earlier, at 5.30 Central African time. Until then, stay safe and happy wherever you happen to be, and I hope you have a wonderful beginning to next week. Bye-bye.